The World Food Summit in 1996 defined food security as existing when all people in all places at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. Commonly, the concept of food security is defined as including both physical and economic access to food that meets people's dietary needs as well as their food preferences. In many countries, health problems related to dietary excess, hence here in the United States, are in, in a sense, it's on the rise. In fact, malnutrition and foodborne diarrhea are today double threats that a number of folks in underdeveloped countries are faced with. Food security is built on three pillars. First, food availability. This means sufficient quantities of food available on a consistent basis. Number two, food access, which is having sufficient resources to obtain appropriate food as for one to ensure their nutrition diet. And number three, food use. The appropriate use based on knowledge of basic nutrition and care, as well as adequate water and sanitation. But what does this mean for our brothers and sisters who are homeless, without shelter, or children living in low-income housing projects that lack proper dietary opportunities? If food security is defined as access to quality food, then food insecurity, according to the USDA, is the state in which consistent access to adequate food is limited by a lack of money, policy, and other resources. Today, we will think about the impact of hunger and malnutrition in our society, the roles leaders and organizations should play in connecting the dots, and the compassionate approach, the compassionate approach to ensure that practitioners are being mindful about this growing epidemic. On that note, let's begin this morning with a short documentary uh, titled Living in a Food Desert. The United States has traditionally been known as a land of plenty, but in recent years, there's been a growing problem of need. Food deserts are defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as areas where people cannot access affordable and nutritious food. They are usually found in impoverished areas that lack grocery stores, farmers markets, and other healthy food providers. Across Virginia, from Hampton to Richmond, Petersburg to Lynchburg, to Wise County and all points in between, approximately 17.8% of the population lives in a food desert. We need more grocery stores in these neighborhoods. If nothing for else, for our, for our kids. I'm, we're getting older, we're not getting any younger. But we don't want that to fall on them that has fell on us. Kim Douglas has spent most of her 55 years living in Hampton, and she's seen a lot of change in that time. This place here, 
It used to be Safeway. Let's come over here and get fresh meats and vegetables. The neighborhood her grandchildren see every day is not the same one she remembers. It used to be where we had grocery stores right around the area. We could just walk out, not even three blocks, and get to a grocery store. This used to be Rich's grocery store. It's not here anymore. Now, there's a convenience store on the corner where we used to have our supermarket. That convenience means a disappointing variety of foods packed with preservatives and empty calories with very few fresh produce options. It also means a steep price tag. Even if you go to the, the uh, convenience stores, the prices are so high. If you want to buy fresh fruit or fresh vegetables, if they sell like the salads and whatnot, you're talking about $4 when you can make a salad for like maybe a buck or two yourself with the fresh produce you have. But now, we don't have that. Kim has struggled with high blood pressure and arthritis for years. That means her wallet and her body can't afford to live on what she finds in her neighborhood. So she has to carefully plan shopping trips in search of nutritious, affordable food for her family. It's frustrating for one because I have to spend money to catch the bus to get there when I could just walk. It's just frustrating you just, just having to figure out how to get to the store sometimes. Over the years, the neighborhood has lost a number of good grocery stores and even a neighborhood produce stand. They took the, stand, the vegetable stand away from us in this neighborhood after they've already taken away our grocery stores. Looking down her streets today, Kim is discouraged. You've got cigarettes, you've got uh, alcohol, you have an ABC store on every corner. You have cigarettes in every store. Uh, you have uh, junk food just sitting there saying, buy me, buy me, you know? And the first thing you want to do is just grab it. Kim worries about neighbors who are content to rely on whatever stores are nearby, especially if they're doing so with low income and meager benefits. And if you're going to these convenience stores every day, trying to get a banana or an apple, or orange, or salad, or whatever. I'm just saying, that's coming away from your household. Even though people don't think about it. So oh, yeah, I get food. Yeah, that's fine. But guess what? The food stamps are going to spend just like money. And once you run out of money, what's left? What's left is certainly not good health. Poor nutrition is linked to obesity, high blood pressure, and diabetes. It's also associated with poor academic performance and behavior issues in children. All of these further strain households that are already facing financial struggles. Does anybody really care? Do they? We're here suffering. All we ask is that you listen to us. I think that all of us can take some responsibility for not being as sensitive um, to the needs of those who are living in our various communities. Delegate Dolores McQuinn represents the 70th district and lives in Richmond. I wonder why they have the same name. Well, I guess because they pulled it out of 577. She became aware of food insecurity while serving on the city council, representing a particularly hard hit district. I was really, I guess, just um, uh, a little bit taken back uh, when there were individuals that would come and knock on my door, actually, asking for food, and particularly young people, uh, young uh, uh, families who um, didn't have, you know, was just struggling from day to day. When children would come and just, you know, say, Miss McQuinn, do you have anything for me to eat? We don't have any food. And that has always, always sort of stuck with me. That's the one you voted for, not that. I didn't sign these, though. After her election to the General Assembly, Delegate McQuinn presented House bills in 2012 and 2013, requesting that the Commonwealth explore the issue and consider solutions. Uh, what was just so interesting to me is not only, you know, the limited knowledge that I brought to the table, but even greater was the limited knowledge that my colleagues had about food deserts. The lack of awareness meant the bill did not get far in 2012 but it got attention from organizations and leaders who reached out to Delegate McQuinn, wanting to help raise awareness and be a part of the solution. She resubmitted the bill in 2013. And uh, out of that, 
grew a greater number of people and organizations that were interested, as well as um, uh, my colleagues who then became a little bit more sensitive to the particular issue. This time around, it was important to educate her fellow delegates on the issue so that they all had an equal understanding of it, even if they hadn't witnessed it firsthand. How do we address this issue? And how do, more than that, how do we bring a level of awareness, you know, to the community overall, to the Commonwealth overall, about food desert and food insecurity so that all of us are on the same page? We were asked, as leading institutions in Virginia, to do a study to say, is this really a problem? And should we really take a look at this? And we have found, through a study that we led, that this is an issue that impacts Virginia. Dr. Jewel Harrison, Dean of the College of Agriculture at Virginia State University, along with her counterpart from Virginia Tech, Dean Alan Grant, co-chaired a comprehensive study that outlined the prevalence and effects of food deserts across the Commonwealth. She led, actually, the task force, just making sure that we're moving in the direction to bring the level of, bring awareness to the public about it, as well as um, that, that we, the recommendation that would come forth that we do something about it. More than 1.4 million people in the state of Virginia live in food deserts, and this issue impacts almost every area across the state of Virginia. When people don't have access to fresh and healthy food and food that they can afford, they're going to buy food where they can get it and they're gonna buy food that they can afford. Typically, that's gonna be unhealthy food. Ultimately, if you continue to eat cheap and unhealthy food, it's gonna to lead to poor health, it's gonna to lead to um, obesity, um, it's gonna to lead to a lot of the diseases, such as high blood pressure and others. So that's why this is such an important issue. Dr. Hairston grew up in Petersburg, which has been identified as one of the most severe food deserts in the Commonwealth. And she recalls that even then, it wasn't an ideal setting for families who made good nutrition a priority. We were miles from a grocery store, but we were very close to a corner store that sold lots of candy and lots of other things. They didn't sell fresh fruits and vegetables, but that's just the way we lived. We were fortunate enough to have transportation, but many around us didn't have transportation, so their only choice was to buy their food from what was close by. Those options lead to poor health, which leads to diminished opportunities in school and work. It's a vicious cycle, Hairston says, because food deserts are concentrated where financial resources are already lacking. The income is certainly a factor because when you take p people's money away, you take their ability to move around, you take their ability to purchase. Also, if a business is going to come in, they're all about making money. They are not gonna set up a high-end grocery store in an area where people can't afford the food that they wanna sell. A complex problem will surely not have an easy solution, Dr. Harrison says. But without a serious concerted effort to intervene, the decline will continue even further. If we don't pay attention to this issue now, it's only going to get worse. The economic downturn that began in 2008 has magnified what was already a serious problem. Even families without a history of poverty or low income have come to find themselves with seriously diminished food budgets. And unfortunately, that typically leads to selecting uh, poor quality food. For example, you can get um, four boxes of macaroni and cheese for a dollar, whereas when someone that is on a limited income walks into a grocery store, they're typically not going to stop in the produce section. So Leslie Van Horn is executive director of the Federation of Virginia Food Banks, which serves hungry citizens across Virginia through food pantries, soup kitchens, and programs targeted specifically to school children and senior citizens. And I would say the biggest group of people who we provide assistance to are the working poor people who lost their jobs and then uh, took another job, but possibly took a pretty big 
uh, pay cut in order to have a job and are really having a tough time making ends meet. In her position, Van Horn has a panoramic view of the problem across the entire Commonwealth and has seen its rapid growth in recent years. Last year, the food banks in Virginia actually distributed uh, over 142 million pounds of food and grocery products. Uh, when I first started this job nine years ago, that figure was at 45 million. So as you can see, the need continues to grow. Unfortunately, children are often the hardest hit. Across the country, 23.5 million people live in food deserts. More than 6 million of these are children. In Virginia, 16.5% of children are considered food insecure, meaning that they cannot be sure where their next meal will come from. You can't get things right until you admit what has gone wrong. For me as a pastor, it gives me more gray hair. It um, keeps me up at night. Um, the thought, the idea that children are going to bed hungry. You don't have to stay where you are. Um, and the ramifications of that. Nobody can keep you there unless you give that person permission. Getting to bed hungry and then waking up the next day and then trying to function in school, trying to function, uh, learning and preparing themselves. Uh, it's, you're already behind the eight ball. You're already a disadvantage. The Reverend Dr. Michael Sanders is the pastor of Mount Olive Baptist Church on Richmond's South Side. Welcome back, brother. Everything good, bro. Each week, his church hosts a food pantry, distributing healthy food to as many as 250 people who stand in line for 30 minutes or more to get it. Okay, you got your bag for them? Okay. If we help them um, in a way that we can by giving them good, nutritious meals, then they've got a chance to prepare themselves for a brighter future. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God has been good to us. That's right. We bless Mount them Olive's Lord. leaders believe the food pantry is essential to their mission, not only because of their Christian faith, but also because their neighborhood is one of the clearest examples of a food desert. In our community, uh, Jeff Davis uh, Highway, uh, you can just stroll down Jeff Davis and you see the liquor stores, you see the convenience stores, you see those stores and institutions that uh, provide things that are, not of, that are not the healthiest. We're located in the highest food desert in Richmond. More children and families go to bed hungry than in any other area in Richmond. But there has to be a resolve to conquer this and wipe it out, and I think that we can, um, but we have to have the will to do it. And I'm not sure that will is there. No fresh produce other than at our church for three miles. No fresh produce for another two miles. No fresh produce three miles. No fresh produce another three miles. This is my community, a food desert. No fresh produce whatsoever. And so our church now is in this community, in this food desert, with this reality, and so what do we do about it? David Olds volunteers his time for the food pantry, delivering and distributing truckloads of food each week. Still, he says, there's sometimes difficulty keeping up with the tremendous need. And then there are times that we, we make two trips in one day to get enough to supply the people that we have. So how many more of them you want me to do? Uh, our hearts goes out for those folks. It's, 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 these people here are really hurting, and they are hurting bad. And not only are they hurting, they are hungry. While it feels good to know that he's doing his part to help, he worries that others who have the power to help in small ways and large might be turning their backs on the issue. We're not here where we are forever. You never know when it's going to happen or can happen to us. So remember that while they are going to be hungry and you're going to be with leftovers and thrown away, think on those people that don't have anything. And maybe that helped them just a little bit. Ironically, similar problems exist in the western, more rural part of the state. 
Lynchburg is a city surrounded by farmland, but that agricultural bounty is not always reflected in its citizens. Well, I'd say we're making a dent in a very large problem. What we do is important, but we're not reaching anywhere near the population affected. John Matheson is president of the board of directors at Lynchburg Grows, an urban farm that works to make fresh produce more accessible through distribution and education efforts. So that's arugula. Yeah, that's arugula over there. Most children that come here cannot identify the vegetables that they're looking at. When they see it, if they see it, it's processed. You know, so a tomato to them is what's pizza sauce, that's a tomato. That lack of familiarity with real food is hard to imagine for most people. But with a lack of transportation, many families have had to rely on convenience stores and fast food for their children's entire lives. Access to healthy food is a real issue, particularly in the old part of the city, the downtown areas. There are no grocery stores. The last grocery store in the general area closed last year. Because the problem is so localized to particular areas, many people are surprised to learn that this problem exists in Lynchburg. Apples, bananas. There's an inherent wealth in the area. Lynchburg is well off, but on the other hand, there's another side to Lynchburg that most people never drive through, never get in touch with. That's the side we see on the van, and it, it's, it, it's eye-opening that there's that much need. Can I get it thirsty? Yeah, very much. And the need is not always among chronically poor citizens. As in Richmond and other parts of the state, many of the people being helped are families whose budgets have only recently taken a hit. They're two for a dollar. A missed paycheck or a broken down car can very quickly lead to a reliance on whatever is within walking distance. These people are not there for a handout. You know, they're just there because they want the fresh produce. And um, it really breaks your heart when they can't afford it that week. We need to extend. Derek Cunningham and Huey Tran are farm managers at Lynchburg Grows. They've become acutely aware of the problem and its roots. Most of the residents that had access to a, a local res, uh, grocery store now have to travel 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes away on a bus. So carrying six to 12 different bags of groceries on a bus gets a little bit more difficult. Food has been moved away from this uh, right, at access right to something that's profitable. And so the lack of accessible grocery stores or what have you is because it's not seen as profitable to feed these people. Nicole Williams is a college student who volunteers at Lynchburg Grows, making deliveries of produce to the communities where it is most sorely needed. She says the experience has made her think about what she takes for granted. Food to us today, like, if we can afford it, it's just food. It's something like, oh, it's food. But to them, because it's not, it's so, such a great of a need to even eat, that it's like, it's just very grateful, and it just shows, like, how the simplest acts can be good. So it just, I mean, it's just a credible feeling. Like I said, you have to see it. Lynchburg resident Charlotte Smith grew up planting, harvesting, and canning a variety of fruits and vegetables. But her declining health has made those days a distant memory, and her shopping choices are limited. I think it's a horrible situation for people like me, because I could ride my wheelchair into a grocery store if it was one here close, and right now it's not. A supermarket moved out of the neighborhood years ago, leaving an empty building behind. Over time, convenience stores began moving in on the surrounding streets. I don't like it. They should at least have one grocery store in this area that is a grocery store, not a junk food store, where guys can go down and buy beer and cigarettes, candy. 
We need a grocery store, not a damn junk store. Okay, you want two more? Can go on bundles. Thank you, Okay. Twice a week, a van from Lynchburg Grows comes to Charlotte's neighborhood to distribute fresh fruits and vegetables. Would you like anything else? I don't think so. Are you sure? Yeah. It makes okay. me feel better knowing I can get some fresh vegetables. I have to watch the clock. My A leaves early today. Don't have to kill myself for them. And I mean, it's disgraceful that we can't have what other people have. Because I live on Social Security, and you know that ain't much. Some people that can barely hold the grocery bag because they're shaking half the time when they're picking it up. These are elderly people that need help just trying to get decent foods. It's hard, especially when you have seen for yourself how hard it is to find food. I mean, healthy food, to have access to healthy food because of the price and the availability of it. It doesn't look good. It's eye-opening to come out on the van and, and, and meet the folks we're helping and realize that, you know, this is a broad spectrum of folks and, um, and there's a tremendous need. Folks like you come out here and help us grow food. We have school groups, corporate groups, families from the neighborhoods we work in that all come out here. We talk about food and why it's important to get access to healthy food and how it's hard to get access to healthy food in lots of parts of the city of Richmond. Back in Richmond, several organizations are working to meet the need in a similar way. Shalom Farms grows a variety of organic fruits and vegetables and works to increase the availability of fresh food to areas that lack a good supply. For us, it's really important to find things that the folks that we work with and the communities that we work with really like. Um, and so the majority of what we grow are things that we've learned from working with folks are most popular. So our most popular crops are tomatoes, sweet potatoes, collards, cabbage. Dominic Barrett, the farm's executive director, has a passion for making sure that people who want good food are able to get it. For us, food is good food is food that's good for our bodies, good for the environment, and good for our communities. Meaning, can we all afford it? Can we all access it? Is it food that we like? Can we share that food? So we'll grow a small amount of unique varieties of fruits and vegetables so folks have a chance to be exposed to them. And if we find out, hey, our friends in Creighton Court or our friends By donating really its like harvest through food banks vegetables. and its own outreach programs, the farm's contribution to hungry Richmond families has reached staggering proportions. This year we'll grow about 85,000 or 90,000 pounds of uh, fresh, local, sustainable food to get to the areas of Richmond where it's hardest to find that good food. There's a level less than 100,000 items in like an average supermarket. So that's a lot of decisions to make, right? We're not talking about there's 100,000 cans. We mean there's 100,000 different products that we're going to have to choose from. Farm manager Steve Miles says that Shalom Farms could not complete their mission without plenty of generous people to offer helping hands. It's a volunteer-based farm. I mean, we have three full-time staff and three interns. Um, without the volunteers, you know, we, none of this would get done. We couldn't possibly, you know, harvest 85 thousand pounds of, of produce or whatever we plan on harvesting without the volunteer help. So when we're planting tomatoes or planting cucumbers, we can plant our little transplant, our seedling, right where that slit is. But operating on a small budget to help people in need doesn't mean that the quality is diminished in any way. The produce that, that you know, someone that lives in, in a food desert in urban Richmond, the produce that they get from Shalom Farms is going to be as good as, you know, you'd find in, in, a, in you know, the higher end. Um, grocery stores in Richmond. In addition to farm stands run by area youth, one creative way Shalom Farms has made good food available to the people who need it is a partnership with Bon Secours Health System called the Prescription Produce Plan. Our goal is to treat fresh fruits and vegetables as medicine and writing prescriptions for folks in these communities where we're trying to close this gap. Each week folks pick up their prescription. It's equal to one serving per person per day for the whole week for the household. And there's some really wild looking beans, our pea pods up there mm, with the purple flowers. Yes. Tricycle Gardens operates an urban farm in Richmond. Director Sally Schwitters said its location underscores the irony of food deserts, where good, healthy food is often so close, 
but so far away. My feeling is that everyone should have access to good, quality, healthy food. Um, particularly when we're seeing that food deserts are identified just three miles from our farm. Three miles. And in the surrounding neighborhood, you can see what remains when the supermarkets people once relied on move to suburban areas and leave them with few options. We have a location just here in our neighborhood that was a grocery store. It's now a dialysis center and it tells the story. This is what happens when food access moves out, uh, lack of health moves in. Like Shalom Farms, Tricycle Gardens relies heavily on volunteers, but farm manager Dennis Williams says they have a small staff for management of everything from crop rotation to greenhouse building. They also manage the farm stand, uh, which uh, is a way for us to get produce out into the Richmond community by selling it. Uh, to Richmond community members. Well, Zeke was saying that during this time of year, there's less, there's not as many flowers like out mm -hmm. naturally. So, Farm um, assistant Emily Reynolds says there are plenty of opportunities for people who want to help with the chores involved in feeding Richmond's hungry citizens. We hold workshops, volunteer days, and we're always welcoming like any um, any member of the community to come um, help us out on those days. The dark beige. Uh, color on the map uh, are low-income census tract areas um, that also are not within one mile of a grocery store and then all of the through its healthy corner store initiative tricycle gardens has found a way to help neighborhood convenience stores offer more than just chips and soda One of the solutions to, to those problems is to begin to collaborate with those corner stores and say, you know, I'm not going to take your apples away, I mean your, your candy bars or your chips, but why don't we create a space in this store to make sure that there are fresh vegetables and fresh fruits and those things that are healthier for an individual. Claire Sadigzade delivers an assortment of healthy produce to the stores, along with help on all the details of selling it. I'm checking in with quarter store owners about um, produce sales, um, feedback from their customers, answering questions, providing opportunities um, to kind of increase marketing and um, sales of the produce. How are things going? Good? Good. Good. Okay. It also means sweetening the deal for consumers by offering recipes and even free samples of the produce. A lot of the produce we grow, families might not be as familiar with or uh, may not have cooked with them before um, or may just not even know if they like them. And so we like to provide no risk opportunities for families to try produce before they invest their limited dollars um, into the foods that we grow. I don't think a lot of people realize how beautiful okra flowers are. They don't, and they're amazed they at what it is. Flowers. Schwitters says that efforts to educate people about produce and encourage a demand for it are especially important for Richmond's youngest residents. You know, I think about a small child who goes to school and engages in a program on nutrition education and hears that they're supposed to eat five fruits and vegetables every day. And then they go home and they pass the corner store and they walk into it and there's candy, there's cigarettes, there's potato chips, um, and lots of soda pop. But there's nothing that their teachers have told them that they should be putting in their bodies. And it's the same thing for their mother, or their grandmother, their auntie, their daddy. Whoever's preparing their food for them, they too don't have access. And, and so, so by changing, changing this, it's changing the culture and it's changing the morale of our community members by saying, we care about you. And you're going to get the best quality food that can be grown in our community. And if you see any of the old pods, you save the seeds so we can plant again. Renew Richmond 
has several sites in the Richmond area, including some that are affiliated with churches and schools. That tomato is on the ground, it's gonna, it gonna rot. And um, what we're gonna do as well, you see the dead leaves and everything, they attract bugs. Jerusalem Connection is its largest site, producing more than 5,000 pounds of food in a season. We're conserving energy, we're conserving, making sure that we're not wasting. John Lewis, director of Renew Richmond, believes that even people who can access good food have gotten too detached from its source. We want everyone from communities, of all, people from all walks of life, to know how to grow their food and know where their food is coming from. Unfortunately, Lewis says too many families are getting their food from convenience stores and fast food restaurants. Richmond is one of the largest cities or largest concentration of food deserts. We have food deserts in Easton, Southside, Northside, Richmond, where uh, individuals that are either at or below the poverty line are, are eating garbage, just plain to say. And when the effort to stock up on healthy food requires time and transportation that people simply don't have, that garbage remains the only option. It's the individuals who suffer, but it's more the children who suffer because they eat whatever is available to them. Lanice Rouse volunteers at the garden regularly. She says it's important to her that her children eat good, healthy food and that they understand where it comes from. Dig a hole right there so we can plant some seeds, all right? You can use your hand. Well, I bring my children here and we come and to see something grow from a seed into a vegetable, then we can take that vegetable home, have it for dinner. Burnt leaves on the bottom, take those off for me. Most people that are involved with community gardens are really glad that people get a chance to taste a fresh vegetable because it changes them right overnight. We're gonna um, pick the rest of the peppers over here. Lewis says it's hard to make people understand the problem or care about solving it when they're not exposed to the obvious signs of it every day. This is not only a local problem, this is a global problem, this is an epidemic, and uh, everyone needs to recognize that it is a threat to human health and development. The frustrating irony is that so much of the solution is in getting back to what once came so naturally to us all. When we get more steaks in a few minutes, we're gonna do like a row over there. We're getting away from the agrarian society, we're getting away from farming, and even knowing where our food comes from. So food in itself, growing food, is a revolutionary idea, but it's not a new one. Operating on a much larger scale is Feed More, which operates in a massive facility in Richmond to collect, prepare, and distribute fresh food through a variety of programs. But CEO Douglas Pick points out that they don't do it alone. Or through some good work, we have some great partnerships with a number of agencies who are in those food deserts. So we partner with them, they find the citizens and the clients. Many of those are churches, about 80 to 90 percent of those are churches, so they have food pantries, which many people are familiar with. Um, and they are able to come here and get food, obviously, at either free or next to nothing, which allows them to serve a lot of people and makes their contributions from their own parishioners go a lot further. But Feed More is more than just a clearinghouse for produce and other kitchen staples. They also work to prepare healthy meals for a variety of clients. Feedmore is a very unique organization. We're the only program in the country that has a Meals on Wheels, a food bank, and a community kitchen all in one. Feedmore has a number of programs that concentrate on bringing food directly to people and places where it's most sorely needed. We have our kids' cafe and summer feeding programs that goes into underserved areas and serves over 2,000 meals a day to these children. Uh, we have a mobile pantry program which is designed to go into food desert areas 
and serve anywhere from 100 to 275 families um, with healthy, nutritious products, including fresh fruits and vegetables. So we got small bags going on. We got small bags going, going uh, being assembled over here in this right. area. We need Paul a bit. Fruit. Amory James is the food production manager for Feedmore. I usually just do a perimeter walk. He says that regardless of their consumer's ability to pay, quality is a high priority in Feedmore's work. We treat um, this establishment um, just like a restaurant. Then we got our pineapple macaroni crisp that we're working on there. If there is anything questionable that we wouldn't serve to our families, we don't serve it to our clients. By the way, yeah, we try to serve what we feel um, we would pay for ourselves. Because it serves such a large number of people throughout the Commonwealth, it has received quite a bit of attention from leaders who want to tackle the problem of hunger and food insecurity in Virginia. Well, hello. Hi, Doug. How are you? Good, Good, Good to, to see, see you, see you again. again. Wonderful. Day. Mrs. McAuliffe has been a tremendous supporter, an advocate for healthy eating, for produce, very proud of what you're for doing. Uh, equitable access to the so. right foods. She has a very big spot in her heart for children and making sure that those kids get a fighting chance to be productive citizens. On a recent tour of Feedmore's facilities, Mrs. McAuliffe saw firsthand the sheer volume of food it takes to feed Virginians in need. The governor and I are very concerned about the fact that in Virginia there are over 300,000 food insecure Virginia children and that's just not a place that we want to be as a commonwealth. She notes the irony of having so much hunger and poor nutrition in a place like Virginia, which is known for an abundance of wealth and healthy crops. It's an enigma in many ways because agriculture is our number one economic industry here and food grows all around us and yet our rural communities and so many of our urban communities, many of them suffer from food deserts. Across the state, these efforts to alleviate the problem have had some success. Community gardens, food banks, corner store initiatives, church and school outreach have all had a part in increasing access to healthy food. But with so many people and organizations working on the problem, why does it persist? And there's no one solution to it. Every county, every city, every area has something that they can do that's going to bring better access to them, but it's not going to be a one-stop solution for the entire state of Virginia. So you really want to look at the assets that are in every community. In a community like Virginia State University, already known for its innovation in cultivating and marketing healthy foods, that has meant exploring a completely different kind of solution. Dr. Marcus Comer was able to get a grant from USDA to do research to determine how we could grow foods in an urban environment, and in this case, grow food inside of a building. So to be able to, to, to research how you could grow that food in a building, Imagine what that can do in terms of food access in a city like Petersburg, Virginia. Dr. Comer says the concept of growing food indoors is not new, but the power required to run grow lights has made it a costly endeavor in the past. Now, with lower energy prices and the improvement of solar energy technology, it's becoming much more cost effective. So by doing that, we will be able to grow a whole room full of food year round and provide fresh vegetables. So with that, once what we grow, we're gonna take it and cart it up on mobile units, kinda like the old ice cream man. And take the food to the neighborhood. Duran Chavis is the Indoor Urban Farms director. He's excited about the project because with the addition of an aquaculture component, it's completely self-contained and self-sustaining. The space, generates its own power through solar energy and the fertilizers for the fruits and vegetables come from the waste from the fish. And not only will folks be able to eat the greens and the vegetables, they'll also be able to eat fish. 
Chavis says the ability to educate citizens about the food they're eating and how they can grow it themselves is essential to the indoor farm. It's important to, for, for any solution around food deserts to not be paternalistic in the sense of you just come in and you drop food off and then you're gone. Because that's not sustainable. Empowering people is the farm's ultimate goal, not only to grow food for themselves, but also to, to market, market that healthy produce to others in the community. community. Um, that addresses the issue, that cuts to the core of it. Because one, you have a community that has high unemployment, high rates of poverty, and what you created is a social enterprise, a business that addresses both the social problem while making money simultaneously. Throughout the Commonwealth, we see citizens and organizations working to solve the problem, educating families so their demand for fresh, healthy food is greater. So our most popular crops are tomatoes, sweet potatoes, collards, cabbage. Improving access so that fresh produce is at least as easy to bring home as chips or cigarettes. 50 cents change. And finding creative ways to connect people to the healthy food they need. But then we also know it is about advocacy, it is about public policy, it's about building um, political systems, social structures that build equity, that create unique communities and systems where people have the access to resources. I mean, food access and hunger is as much about urban planning and public policy as it is about sustainable agriculture, at least in my opinion. As a pastor uh, and as a person, it's disturbing the, the thought that um, uh, not only in the city of Richmond, but in this country that we have uh, children and families in 2014 going to bed hungry is a mind-blowing thought and um, I think an indictment against us um, as a society. It's poverty issues um, and it's uh, grocery stores seeing that they're not getting the return and being in low-income communities um, and so they've moved out. I really believe that big businesses don't care anymore about these smaller neighborhoods. The need is far beyond what most people see. It can't be seen as a small problem. It needs to be seen as an everyone problem. You know, you might go to a more affluent neighborhood and you might have four or five grocery stores within, you know, half a mile of each other. But you can go into a poor neighborhood and there's no grocery stores for over a mile. Politicians don't do shit for us. They think about it for themselves. They don't worry about people like us. And they don't. I don't think they ever have. We have the capacity in the state of Virginia to do something about this particular issue, to make sure that you know, the right stores are there, that the quality and the quantity is made available in communities. Again, it is a matter of just collaborating. It's a matter of bringing people to the, to, to, to the, fore, to the table and then making them aware there's a problem here, this is the solution. I don't like it. They should at least have one grocery store in this area that is a grocery store, not a junk food store, where guys can go down and buy beer and cigarettes, candy. We need a grocery store, not a damn junk store. I really believe that big businesses don't care anymore about these smaller neighborhoods. Well, Lynchburg has a 24.5% poverty rate. So we have a significant number of people who are underserved when it comes to food. It's certainly a problem here in Virginia, and um, even more so here in Richmond and in the Richmond region. Um, our city's been rated as the worst food desert in the country for a city our size. And I mean, it's disgraceful that we can't have what other people have. If a business is going to come in, they're all about making money. They are not gonna set up a high-end grocery store in an area where people can't afford the food that they wanna sell. My name is Victor Manalo, and I'm the director of the Claremont Corps. I'm very happy to introduce Claire Fox, who is the executive director of the Los Angeles Food Council. Please help me in welcoming Claire Fox. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning. 
It's such an honor to be here. I'm very excited. My task today is to sort of set the tone and to provide a context for the conversation that we'll have throughout the day. And I want to invite us into a conversation about the intersection of food and social change, or food and empowerment. Empowerment is a key part of social change, so I see them as, as all connected. So, you know, as we all know, and as you're studying in your programs, I'm sure we, we are facing so many pressing social, economic, environmental, and racial justice issues in this society. So why would we talk about food? What does food have to do with that? And we saw the video this morning, so we've already began that discussion. Um, you know, when I think about the major challenges that face us as a society, if I had to boil it down to one thing, which is hard to do, but if I had to, I would say it has to do with disconnection, right? Disconnection between ourselves and the earth, and disconnection between each other as people and as communities. And what I love about food is that it's a vehicle for inherent connection. It inherently connects us to the earth, which sustains us, and it connects us to each other through a shared experience when we break bread together. That is a universal and ancestral ritual that every one of us experiences um, and all of our ancestors have across time and history. It's an everyday activity, so it's familiar to all of us. Um, and it's this shared cultural, sensory, embodied experience. Um, and it also touches, food touches every aspect of our lives on a macro level as well from environmental stewardship to economic development, entrepreneurship, poverty, immigration, health, politics, from a global level down to our neighborhood, food is a part of it. Food can reconnects us to all of those issues. And of course, our own experiences of food are informed by our experiences of class, how we grew up, our socioeconomic background, race, gender, ethnicity, and where we grew up. And so because of these simultaneous personal and sacred aspects of food, along these major social and political aspects, I feel that food invites people to the table, so to speak, and food metaphors are just so abundant, it's great. Um, it invites people to the table to consider social change in new ways, because it is so multifaceted and so personal and yet so political. So, before we talk about some solutions, I want to set the context for what we're up against and what the challenges are and how within our food systems we have undermined our health, our environment, our economy, and even some of our approaches to social change um, within the food system have been flawed. So I'm going to start by walking us through some statistics. Let's see if this works. 15 million. 15 million is the number of Californians who either have diabetes or pre-diabetes. And this is hot off the presses from a report for, uh, out from UCLA Center for um, Health Policy Research. This just came out a couple weeks ago. So within that 2.5 million Californians have diabetes, and then um, what would that be? Seven and a half, eight million people are estimated to have pre-diabetes. That's 55% of all adults in California. That is a staggering number. When I first heard this, I just it blew me away. And the study discusses that if we don't do something very soon, if we don't have a massive intervention, that 30% of those who have prediabetes will develop type 2 diabetes in the next five years. So the, one of the researchers who is on the radio talking about this said, we can expect a tsunami of type 2 diabetes in the state of California, and that's a cost to all of us. The total estimated cost of diabetes to the state is $27 billion, and that would be including direct medical care and indirect costs associated with the disease. So who is most at risk? Who are we talking about? This same study found that young people and people of color are most at risk for type 2 diabetes. One in three young people, one in three young people is estimated to have pre-diabetes in California. That's unbelievable. And at least half of Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, and African Americans are estimated to have pre-diabetes. At least half. And, you know, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with type 2 diabetes in particular, it's, it's a pretty serious thing if it goes untreated in particular. It can lead to blindness, to liver and kidney failure, amputation, premature death. It's really, it's really a tough disease. Um, what led to this? How do we get to this? Well, the researchers said that, you know, our communities have been designed 
for disease. They are designed in a way that do not facilitate physical activity and our communities are inundated with unhealthy foods and in particular the particular culprit that they named is sugar sweetened beverages, soda, which is the number one source of sugar in the American diet. But not all communities are designed the same and that's why we see these gross disparities along uh, race and class. 12 years. 12 years is the difference in life expectancy between a person who's born in Watts versus a person who's born in Bel Air. And this is according to the City of LA's Health Atlas, which came out just a couple years ago, where they mapped health outcomes all across the City of LA. And looking at different indicators, everything from asthma to uh, exposure to violence, access to parks, fast food consumption, all of these diverse um, health outcomes, when they mapped it out, the same neighborhoods fare well, time and again, and the same neighborhoods fare very poorly. And the dividing line is around race and class. And of course, this is a result of longstanding racial and economic inequities that are across our entire society, not unique to Los Angeles in any way. And these racial inequities are structural in nature. And when we think about our local food system and the design of our communities, what is one of the ways that that shows up principally? Well, grocery stores. So let's take a little walk down history and um, spend some time in the neighborhood surrounding Watts, Watts and its surrounding, which would be South Los Angeles. Um, between the 60s and 70s, 60s and 80s really, there was this slow migration of supermarkets and grocery stores out of the inner city um, as middle class white families moved to the suburbs, white flight. And grocery stores went with them perceiving that as a profitable demographic, land in the suburbs was cheaper, permitting was easier, and there was the ability to charge more for products. And then ongoing racism, redlining by banks, perceptions of safety, perceptions of profitability, which was discussed in the video, sustained this trend over so much time, leaving South LA with a lack of adequate grocery services. After the 1992 uprisings or riots, um, city officials got together with grocery uh, industry leaders and said, guys, we have, to, we have to address this issue. We have to build more grocery stores. There's a real problem here. And everyone, you know, there's lots of blue ribbon ceremonies and proclamations, and there was this agreement that 32 new grocery stores would be built. And a study 10 years later found that more grocery stores had been built, but others were closed. So there had been a net gain of one new grocery store in South LA. And this is not unique to LA. Nationally, we see that predominantly white neighborhoods have three times as many supermarkets as predominantly black neighborhoods, and nearly twice as many as Latino neighborhoods. Um, and the crazy thing about this, I mean, it's crazy because it's racism, but there's unmet need that has been documented. In LA, every year, $113 million leave South LA in grocery purchases elsewhere. So it's families buying groceries because they need food in other neighborhoods. So it's, it's dollars and cents leaving South LA because guess what, people buy food. And that's been documented. So this notion of profitability, you know, are people gonna buy these, you know, are they gonna partake in these services is, is wild because it's been documented that that need is there. So when we talk about the rise of type two diabetes, we really can't help but see this as a racial justice issue. And where you live should not determine how long you live or the quality of your life. And one of the greatest you know, paradoxes of our time is that as we've seen the rise of diet-related diseases like diabetes and other diet-influenced health outcomes like the rise of obesity, we also have seen the rise of hunger and food insecurity. 1.5 million is the number of people in Los Angeles County who face food insecurity. And there was a report from the Department of Public, LA County Department of Public Health that came out last year that found that that's a 40% increase over the last 10 years. What, what are we talking about when we say food insecurity or food security? The American Institute of Nutrition defines food security as access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. Seems reasonable, right? Something that seems like a human right. Food insecurity is defined by the USDA as ex the experience of reduced quality, variety, or desirability of diet, or disrupted eating patterns and reduced intake of food. So 
Hmm, that's a lot of words. In real life terms, what are we talking about? We're talking about parents skipping meals so that they can feed their kids, right? Or we're talking about kids who are really getting their only real meal of the day at school, but are going to bed uh, with a belly ache. Food insecurity can lead to hunger, and it also can lead to malnutrition, and it's been associated with poor health outcomes overall, inc including increased odds of hospitalization, especially for children, and increased prevalence of chronic diseases, depression, other mental health issues among adults. The root of hunger and food insecurity, and really the greatest threat to health overall, is poverty. And ultimately, if we are to eliminate hunger from our midst and achieve, achieve truly equitable health outcomes, we have to consider how our economy can lift all boats. 23% is the percentage of food workers that use food stamps and that compares to 11% of the general population. That's pretty crazy, right? So the people who are growing food for us, distributing it, packing it, shipping it, serving it to us at restaurants, have a greater incidence of needing food stamps, which by the way isn't called food stamps anymore. <laughs> it's the federal program is called SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Here in California, we call it CalFresh, but very few people know what CalFresh or SNAP are, so we still say food stamps. Um, and the rate of food insecurity that has been documented among food workers is 18%, which compares to 17% for the general population. So both in terms of usage of food stamps and food insecurity, you see higher incidence among those workers within our food system, those people who put food on our tables. Workers all along the food chain face some of the harshest working conditions and lowest wages in the country. And yet, here in LA County, one in eight jobs is in the food system. Our local food economy is a two, a two billion dollar economic engine. We're home to some of the world's most cutting edge culinary talents and our food supply chain employs 1.3 million people. That's here in LA. So are we making sure that those that feed us, those food workers and their families are not going home with empty pockets and hungry bellies? And of course, can our food economy be sustained if our industry practices are out of alignment with the earth? Our food system is a top contributor to air and water pollution, soil depletion, and greenhouse gas emissions. 20% is the percentage of global greenhouse gas emissions that is attributed to the food system. Excessive use of synthetic pesticides, concentrated animal waste, monocrop farming, over tillage, global shipping, and extreme wastage are all some of the practices that have put our environment and the resiliency of our food supply in jeopardy. Just this week, there was a new study out from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in Germany, and they found that agriculture and the food system is a major driver of climate change, which wasn't that new, but what they found was that a large portion of those emissions could be reduced simply by reducing waste, because 30 to 40% of everything that's grown on this planet is wasted at some point along the supply chain. And if food, they, they said that if food loss and waste, food loss and waste were its own country, it would be the third largest GHG emitter in the world. Pretty staggering. So let's take this a little bit closer to home. I want to talk about LA and what's going on in our landfills. One third of our municipal waste stream is comprised of organic matter and most of that is food. And what happens when food lands in a landfill is that it breaks down and it rots and emits methane gas, which is a highly toxic greenhouse gas, um, into the atmosphere. And of course, all the water, all the energy, all the labor that went into growing that food is also being thrown away. 80% of water in the state of California goes towards agriculture. So if a third of what we're throwing away is food, we're throwing away that water as well. Such a precious resource should never be wasted. Obviously, we have an issue of hunger, we can feed people, we can compost it and rebuild our soils, and we can convert it into energy. The options are truly endless. So as you can see, you know, the issues are, are many. The challenges are many and they're complex. And then to make matters even more complicated, the food system itself is touched by a wide array of different government departments and regulatory agencies. You know, you think about the Department of Agriculture is setting policy for farmers 
and then you have the department of or an agency that's focused on economic development, trying to promote culinary adventures for tourists or food businesses. The Department of Public Health is looking at health outcomes, and they're also regulating restaurants. Um, the school district buying food and serving it to youth, many of them low income. So each of them in their own ways, coming up with solutions to the problems that they see, but not very many of them in communication with each other or coordinating their efforts. And what happens when we come up with solutions in a silo, it might work for our context, but we could actually be creating problems for someone else upstream or downstream. So food policy councils were created as a solution to this problem. It's a way to increase coordination system-wide and to create change. They're designed to bring together diverse leaders and stakeholders, not just in government, but also innovators in the nonprofit sector, in the private sector, community members, to achieve a 360 view on what's going on so that together with this holistic perspective at the table, the policy solutions that we come up with are considering the whole and not just parts of it. And the Los Angeles Food Policy Council, where I work, is, is an example of that. There's actually over 300 food policy councils in North America, um, and ours is one of the newer ones. We were founded in 2011, so we haven't been around that long. We're a network collaborative designed to catalyze, coordinate, and connect diverse leaders from across our local food system, and that would include farmers and gardeners, food processors, distributors, farm and food worker advocates, anti-hunger advocates, chefs, grocers, policymakers, public health practitioners, urban planners, students, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. Literally, food touches all of us. So we're all stakeholders in the food system. And our organization is designed to bring everyone together um, and make Southern California a good food region for everyone where food is available. Oh, I meant to show you that picture first. These are some fun pictures from Food Day that we do every year. Our goal is to create a region that honors these values, local economies, environmental sustainability, fair treatment of workers, humane treatment of animals, and of course, healthy food avail available for all communities, but particularly communities where we know there's the greatest need. We have to focus our attentions. That's why we place, at the center of our values, we place equity at the center of all things. I like to think of our work as an innovation in democracy because we're busting through silos and creating new spaces of civic engagement where communities can work collabor collaboratively together in new ways for sustainability and equity. And so what do we do exactly? Well, we convene and activate food leaders, we conduct research and provide policy recommendations, and we facilitate catalytic product projects and programs that expand access to healthy food and support the vibrancy and fairness of our local food system. And how do we do this? Collaboration, that's the number one word. We're guided by a leadership board of executive level leaders representing the food system, public, private, nonprofit sector. We host regular public convenings that we call the network, kind of like the gathering. <laughs> um, and that's, that brings together hundreds of change makers focused on food. But the real heart and soul of our operation is that we host eight working groups focused on different food policy areas. These are open working groups. And each one is very different. Some of them focused on policy, some of them focused on best practices and resource sharing. Um, and I'd like to share with you some of, the, some of the solutions that have come about from this ecosystem of collaboration. I also want to give a shout out because Rudy is one of our leadership board members and we work very closely with uh, Learn. So I'm excited that he's here and you're going to get to hear about some of the work that they're up to. So what have we been able to accomplish with this collective impact? Well, one of the most effective ways to change the food system on a very large scale is to change the way that large public institutions spend their food dollars. You can sort of think of this as voting with your fork, which we do all the time. Um, if, you're, if you're engaged in this work and you're thinking about what you're putting in your body, you know, every time we go to the grocery store or the farmer's market, we're expressing our values, right, through our food purchases and through what we put in our body. Well, imagine if school districts, cities, universities, hospitals, large institutions came together and demanded good food. Their collective impact would literally redirect billions of dollars to sustainable fair suppliers, and that would have ripple effects for the entire system and for the entire economy. 
This is the premise of the Good Food Purchasing Policy, which is an initiative that the Food Policy Council uh, launched in 2012. It creates a transparent supply chain from farm to fork, and it provides clear standards to help institutions measure and make shifts in their food purchases in line with five key values. And here they are, local economies, environmental sustainability, valued workforce, animal welfare, and nutrition. Uh, some of you may be familiar with LEED certification for buildings. It's like a green, green building certification. Very similar. It's designed like LEED, but for good food um, for major institutions. So what we're doing is we're helping organizations like, or institutions, I should say, like the City of Los Angeles and Los Angeles Unified School District know that their dollars, which are our dollars, public dollars, are going to companies that are supporting local economies, that are treating their workers' rights, raising animals humanely, protecting our environmental resources, and of course, expanding access to healthy food. And it really couldn't have come about without a very large range of diverse stakeholders at the table. That's the hallmark of this policy, is that it brought together all of these multiple perspectives, health, the environment, agriculture, labor, and it was through the process of building consensus that we were able to create a set of standards that, as far as we know, are the most comprehensive in the nation. It's the most comprehensive food procurement policy. So as an Angelina, it's something I take really great pride in. You know, I think in LA we don't brag enough about the amazing work that we do. Um, we're now working with cities and school districts across the country to implement the same state set of standards. So it's very, very exciting. In 2012, the city of LA adopted this policy and then um, shortly thereafter, LA Unified School District, the second largest school district in the country, also adopted it. So I want to tell you a little bit about what that has done, what some of the impact has been. The school district has really used the good food purchasing policy as a roadmap for making changes in the way that they procure food. Since 2012, LA Unified School District has redirected $12 million in produce purchases to local growers, and its suppliers have therefore created over 150 new well-paying jobs in LA County. Their suppliers swapped uh, conventional wheat to California-grown sustainable wheat. The district also adopted Meatless Mondays, which they calculate has led to a savings of 19.6 million gallons of water within our local food system. And they're also trying to figure out how to source from really small farms in the region. And they're beginning to monitor how their suppliers treat their workers. Most recently, the district committed to 100% antibiotic-free chicken. All of these changes have occurred as the district is also working to improve the nutritional quality and the appeal of the 650,000 daily meals that it serves its students, many of whom are least able to afford good food. So this is something we're really proud of. We're continuing to um, implement it with the city of LA, with the Department of Aging through their senior meals programs. The Greek theater, if any of you have gone to concerts there, they're about to implement this policy. So the food menu at the Greek is gonna be super different this summer. You gotta check it out. It's gonna be really amazing. So now I'd like to talk about, and sort of in brief, some of the other um, policy solutions that have come forward, some of the other wins to, to get you thinking about what's possible. So in the realm of urban agriculture, some of you may be familiar with the story of Ron Finley. Uh, he had a TED talk that kind of blew up and went international, so a lot of folks know his work. He's an artist and uh, a gardener in South Central Los Angeles. He was cited by the city of LA for growing food in the parkway, which is that space of land between the sidewalk and the street. And that may not seem like much, but in a dense urban environment, for folks who want to grow food, you grow it where you can, and you may not have access to land. And so Ron said, you know what? This parkway is really ugly, and it's collecting trash. I'd like to do something else. And as an artist, he also had kind of an eye for beauty and how to bring more beauty into the neighborhood environment. And sure enough, he got in trouble. They told him to take out the garden. They fined him. And there were several other urban gardeners across city of LA that faced similar um, penalties. Finally. It was a long process, so I'm giving you the short version here, but city council did end up taking action and updating the municipal code, so now edible gardens are allowed in parkways. And you know, there's a lot of advantages to urban agriculture. Obviously, you're expanding access to fresh food, you're supplementing food budgets by having food grown in neighborhood environments. You can capture and clean storm water and repair soil. You create community and beauty in the neighborhood environment. But land access and land security are an ongoing issue. And so another policy that we've been working on for the last couple of years that passed three days ago 
is the Urban Agriculture Incentive Zone Policy. LA County Board of Supervisors just passed this and what it would do is it provides a tax incentive to property owners of vacant lots to open up their land and make it available for urban farms and community gardens. Yeah, it's really, it's great. So it's thanks to the work of Ron and all of the diligent urban farmers out there who have had to deal with a lot of frustration um, for so many years that we're able to finally get some momentum and think about how do we re creatively repurpose vacant lots, for example, which are a true drain on community life, um, particularly in low-income communities, into a, a greater community-serving purpose. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was an LA Times editorial board article that said, Los Angeles does love its farmers markets but not all Angelinos can use them. Of the approximately 60 certified markets in LA, only half of them accept the modern version of food stamps, electronic benefits transfer cards, EBT cards. There's something terribly wrong when Jack in the Box and corner, store, corner liquor stores eagerly accept EBT, but a farmer's market does not. And we wholeheartedly agree. Um, this is something that LA Food Policy Council and our partners have been working on. We have a strategy to reach 100% universal EBT access at all farmers markets in the city of LA. We're doing on the ground outreach to farmers market managers, partnering with USDA to do an EBT sign up day next month. Um, and there's a policy that's been introduced by the city council looking at how can we require farmers markets. I mean, it's great if we touch all the farmers markets that exist today, but what about future farmers markets? It would be great to institutionalize that so that any farmer's market that wants to come into the city of LA is welcome to do so as long as they make it accessible to everybody regardless of income. Um, so that's something we're really looking forward to and it's, it's sort of a no-brainer. There's a lot of research that shows that it's good for the finances of the farmer's market to accept EBT. You know, we had a panel about this in February and one of the panelists who is an EBT recipient who shops avidly at farmer's market said, my green, my EBT green is good as anyone else's green. And it's true, and it's more money in the pockets of small local farmers. So it's an all around win-win, and the fact that we're so behind is, is pretty shocking. When we talk to farmer's market managers who are reticent to implement EBT, they say, well, we don't have those customers here which is a really powerful and deep statement. You don't, what do you mean you don't have those customers here? How do you know? How do you know that? Um, so there's a lot of perceptions and frankly classism and racism, I think, that goes into that. So we're really, we're trying to work with market managers and say, look, this is a real opportunity for your market. It's the right thing to do and it makes good business sense. We are also engaged in a fight for um, legal, citywide legalization of street food vending. It's actually illegal to vend on city sidewalks in the city of LA, um, even though you always see, you know, fresh fruit carts or taco stands, um, elotes. We love street food culture in LA, um, but unfortunately the law does not love street vendors and it's a real issue that we see entrepreneurs, hardworking entrepreneurs being criminalized every day. Their carts are confiscated, they're given egregious fines. Um, and so it's our hope that a permit system will bring vendors out of the shadows. The city of LA estimates that there's 50,000 sidewalk vendors in, in the city. And we wanna support these small businesses. They're a vital part of our local food economy. And of course, hello, it's a great way to bring healthy food um, in an easy way into communities. And I'm hoping that Rudy will talk a lot more about this because he's um, deeply in engaged in this campaign as well. Um, and there's, it's been a long journey, but it's something that we're really committed to. We also work with mom and pop corner stores and neighborhood markets that are residing in low-income communities, many of them themselves low-income, and help them, empower them to bring fresh fruits and vegetables and other healthy food into the area. We, we do this through uh, partnering directly with entrepreneurs. That's actually Rudy right there, having a moment with Nelson Garcia, who is a store owner in South LA. Um, when we first met Nelson, his store was called uh, $1 Warehouse. It was not a dollar warehouse. He just bought the business and that's what it was called. Um, and he always felt like it was kind of an odd fit. It wasn't fully his business. And so through the process of working with him, he kind of remade himself. He renamed the business Alba Snacks and Services. Alba's his wife's name. Snacks and Services is what he does. Um, he's right next to a junior high and high school. And so he wanted to, to kind of bring himself 
forward as a leader for healthy food in the community. And we did a whole market makeover. And then another key aspect of the work is business development. You know, when you bring the fresh fruits and vegetables into the store, how do you know you're going to make money? Um, so we work with entrepreneurs to figure out sort of the business modeling aspect of it. And that program is called the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network. We've trained over 250 mom and pop grocers. Um, many of them in South LA, but all over LA County. And currently there's 15 in the pipeline for pretty robust uh, store transformation projects. Um, and then lastly, I will just talk a little bit about food waste. Um, we formed a food waste working group last year. They're focused on eliminating the million tons of food that is sent to LA County, uh, to LA landfills every year through policy strategies for recovering food. If the food is still edible, it should be going to hunger relief sites. Um, or we should be converting it into livestock feed, energy compost, and of course supporting high environmental social worker standards um, within the, the waste industry. So our focus for this year is we're promoting community composting. There's a lot of regulatory shifts happening at a state level, improving donation of surplus foods to food banks from restaurants and caterers, and then utilizing health inspectors as educators about food waste, recycling, and donation options. So at this point, you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot of information. <laughs> there's a lot of challenges, and there's a lot of good work that's being done. What am I supposed to do, and what is my role in all of this? And so I want to just close with some thoughts for how you might see yourself as a part of this story. As I said, food touches all of us, so you're all critical stakeholders in making these changes. Obviously, the most simple way we've already talked about, it's voting with your fork. You know, as a consumer, you have the ability to express what you believe in. You can buy from companies that have um, environmental practices, but you might also want to check out how they treat their workers or how their suppliers treat their workers. That's harder to find out, but it's good to ask. And the more you ask, the more you're communicating the importance of that and to also support institutions that are aligned with your values. You know, in LA, we're really lucky. We've got incredible culinary culture, um, and I feel like every day there's new articles coming out about how LA, how LA is the new cuisine, you know, global cuisine hotspot. But we really cannot lose sight of the fact that not everybody can enjoy the bounty. So I think we can make a difference as well by supporting those businesses like Nelson Garcia's store, you know, that are really looking to expand access to um, historically disenfranchised communities and also supporting um, people of color owned businesses, women owned businesses, um, and building that community power through money and through wealth building in communities. I also think people underestimate your voice in the policy process. Um, I've seen this time and again, you know, policy was not created to be inclusive, and that's on purpose. It was not designed to be participatory. But, and your letters to your elected official showing up, making public comment at city council, at LA County Board of Supervisors, it really does make a difference. They do pay attention. So don't underestimate that. And then most importantly, I hope you find a place to, your place to grow as an advocate for change. You know, I see the entire project of the LA Food Policy Council as an experiment in how you get more people activated as leaders and as change makers, engaging with policy, creating new pathways of participation, interrupting the old paradigm. My favorite quote is by Albert Einstein. He said, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking that we were at when we created them. So I'm really interested in how we can elevate and shift our level of thinking through a collaborative, creative, and democratic process so that new solutions can emerge. And we might be surprised. Sometimes people say, what's the future of the Food Policy Council, Claire? And I say, the process will show us. Collective intelligence, when it comes together and when we activate ourselves as powerful humans, will show us what the future is. So allow yourself to be surprised. Allow yourself to not predetermine what you think the right answer is. We know that many of the old solutions that have been put forward have actually not panned out. They failed us. So we really have to get creative. And I hope that you will join me in that endeavor. Thank you. And now I'm, I'm really excited to be able to bring in our other panelists here. And I'm going to have each of them uh, give just a brief overview of the work that they're doing in regards to uh, food insecurity, 
and, uh, and then we'll open it up um, to a panel discussion and I'll have some questions that I'll be throwing out to the panel and uh, in the hopes that uh, we'll be able to continue to think about um, all the things that, uh, that we're learning and that we're about here at Claremont Lincoln and how to be able to apply that not only to this issue, but to other issues that are out there that we're working with and that we're facing today. So uh, we'll go ahead to Rudy. I'll have Rudy Espinoza uh, begin. Hi, everybody. Claire, thank you so much for that presentation. I, it was really good. <laughs> and I've heard you speak a lot of time, and it's a perfect preface to, I hope, the conversation today. Uh, my name is Rudy. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit community development organization called LEARN, which stands for Leadership for Urban Renewal Network. Uh, we are uh, an organization has three divisions to the work that we do. We, we do advocacy work, we have our own economic development initiatives, and then we have an in-house consulting practice that supports for-profits and non-profits with research and program design support. Um, our mission is to bring people together to uh, find creative ways to revitalize low-income neighborhoods. Uh, when we created the organization almost nine years ago, uh, it was a volunteer group and it was a multidisciplinary coalition of, of young professionals that were upset with what was happening, uh, that were upset with the numbers that Claire uh, just uh, sh showed us. And we wanted to do something different. We wanted to, to think about the future and design new solutions because we felt that our neighborhoods, um, specifically in Los Angeles, looked the same no matter who we elected or how much funding some of our programs got. They kept, it, it actually was getting worse. So LEARN, um, I often describe it as a laboratory, um, and we try to, you know, quote unquote, innovate or, or think differently. Um, a lot of our work is very collaborative. Um, in addition to uh, my work at LEARN, I have a lot of what I call, quote unquote, extracurricular activities. I, I work with Claire on the, on the leadership board of the LA Food Policy Council. I'm on the board of uh, a social enterprise called LA Kitchen. Uh, I sit on the board of Esperanza uh, Community Housing Corporation in South Los Angeles, an affordable housing developer. And then um, I'm also uh, on, I serve on the board of transportation commissioners uh, for the city of LA. I, I studied business and urban planning in school. Um, and that's kind of my thing, and um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Rudy. AJ? Hi, my name is AJ Rolan. I'm the founder of an organization called Hashtag Lunch Bag. Uh, Hashtag Lunch Bag was founded on Christmas, two, uh, Christmas Day 2012. Uh, myself, along with a group of friends, were just looking for an opportunity to give and um, you know being the procrastinators that we were we started googling the morning of and of course anything that we were able to find uh, we found it pretty difficult to find an opportunity to give our time to um, so we just created it ourselves we went to our local grocery store we uh, decided that we were just going to arbitrarily feed 100 people so we bought enough food from our local Ralph's in a mid-city mid Wilshire area and um, what went into these meals were basically meals that we would want to eat you know, that our mothers would make for us in, in middle school and, you know, the fruit snacks and the sandwiches and the Capri Sun and the water and the fruit. And uh, we, we capped them off with uh, handwritten love notes that we just wanted to, to, to provide to the recipients. Uh, the, the meal that we provided them, we knew was just going to last them for a couple hours, but the note and acknowledging their humanity is what we what we intended to, 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 to do with that. Um, when we drove around L.A. and we, we passed them out, um, well, once we were very quickly able to hand out 100 meals, we, we shared our experience on our individual social media platforms. And we jokingly named it hashtag lunchbag. We spelled the word hashtag out just to make fun of hashtags because people always misuse them. And it rhymed. And who doesn't like anything that rhymes? So um, well, the, the interesting thing that happened at that point is we began to receive a lot of feedback from our friends, followers in the form of calls, text messages, emails, likes, comments, and asking us, Oh my God, that's amazing. That looks like so much fun. I've never heard of this organization. Let us know when you're going to do this again. And, and for us, it was just, you know, days like Christmas and Thanksgiving are, are, are days where you tend to think about, you know, giving your time. Um, but, you know, there's, there's obviously 365, 364 other days a year that you can, you can do that. So because it was fun, um, we decided to do it again the following month and just reach out to whoever said that they were interested. Um, 10 people ended up showing to, up to my house. We made 150 meals, up the ante a little bit. Um, we shared our experience once again, jokingly tagging it with that same tag. And we, we, got, we got some retweets from some people with a substantially high number of followers. So at that point, 
um, we decided to just build a website telling people what we were doing and why we were doing it. It wasn't necessarily, there was no business plan, there was no specific issues that we were passionate about. It was just something that we thought was fun and it was second nature to build a very, very simple approach to here's some friends they wanted to give, couldn't find anything, this is what we did, here's a step-by-step -step breakdown on how you can do it yourself, going down to a PDF shopping list and even a Spotify playlist to make it fun. Um, at that point, it was something that we committed to doing the last Sunday of every month here in LA, and our movement has grown to over 100 communities all over the world in just over three years. Um, what, what we found as we build everything, essentially, we built, every, this was a grassroots effort that we built backwards. And we found that there, though there was no intention of you know, tackling these, these food related issues, what we realized is we were building communities around food and using food as a way to, to build these communities and empower the individuals who, you know, for whatever reason are attending our events, whether they're seeking connection from other humans or they, they want to genuinely do good and they're not able to find the opportunities the way that, that the pain point that we were experiencing when we, when we began this. And um, just, just spread love, right? And, and by acknowledging the humanity of the people that we're feeding, we're acknowledging the humanity in ourselves. And for the first time in, in, in the history of the world, every single person has the ability to effortlessly share these experiences and inspire the masses. So um, there's a lot of people in this room and in this world that are doing good work. We just want to build communities and create the awareness so that these solutions could be implemented. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now the reason why uh, uh, what we're going to be doing um, this morning in this panel, this afternoon now, um, is really focusing on um, uh, because I'm the director of the Claremont Corps, we'll be talking about some of the the things, the concepts that we talk about in our core curriculum: uh, mindfulness, dialogue, collaboration, and change. And so I'm going to throw out some questions to the panel uh, regarding some of those things, and and how do these how do these concepts kind of play out in terms of their response, um, the response to this issue that you've heard today. So our, you know, the first course that we have is a course called Mindfulness. And so I'm wondering how is, uh, and in that class, it's really about developing, helping students to kind of, to develop self-awareness, uh, which would lead to compassion, and in the hopes later on to um, uh, compassionate acts, right? So. Um, can you tell us uh, a little bit in, y in your experience, um, how has uh, self-awareness and, and or compassion kind of worked into uh, your decision to um, I I what you're doing today? Who wants to start? Um, so for me, um, to, to go a little bit into the, the, the what, I've, what, what we've realized with our program is um, as we were, you know, kind of blindly moving forward with our commitment to host these events every single month, we realized we, we when we got to the point of applying for a nonprofit organization and we were thinking about what our mission was, um, we we knew we weren't with our singular acts every month. We weren't do we weren't eradicating hunger. But what we realized what we were doing is if I, if I go back to what brought me to this place and to this movement in the first place, um, there's a lot of things going on in my personal journey and um, my, I was having some severe mental health issues and what I was prescribed was to go out and do a random a series of random acts of kindness and when I couldn't find anything I created it and then 10 months into this when we'd grown to over 30 cities all over the country we realized that that's what was in, what, what was the primary motivating force for the majority of the people that were coming in as they were sharing their individual experiences and though that was impact that was very difficult to track and measure, we felt that that was, we're not feeding the most people, we're not the most efficient when it comes to our cost ratio, on, but on the quantitative side, but on the qualitative portion of it, we're providing a very fun and cool and easy experience for people to get out of themselves, even if it's for a couple of hours. So by appealing to people's, um, you know, self-awareness and inspiring mass compassion, um, we, we feel that, that that's that is the it's it's more the intention and the love that goes into pr preparing these meals and sharing these experiences that's essentially creating an uh, endless ripple effect that creates to a big wave that leads to a bigger wave of change. Great. 
uh, mindfulness and compassion is something that's like a daily practice uh, for me in my personal life, but then also in my work. And uh, I try to incorporate it as much as possible into the work that my team does at Learn and even in the initiatives that, that, that we do. Um, because I think that the only way to uh, achieve the missions that we set out to accomplish is through uh, a very high level of compassion and empathy. Uh, this morning, I went on a run uh, with a couple of friends in uh, at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, and I opened my trunk of my car, and I have like a random box of books in there. <laughs> and so my friend was like, why do you have all these books? And I was like, oh, I'm moving them. And then she's like looking through them, and I was like, feel free to take one if, if you'd like. And the, the book that she took was from uh, was uh, Tattoos on the Heart by Father Greg Boyle, who's the founder of Homeboy Industries. And she's like, I've never read this book. And I was like, you have to read this book. And... The reason why I love the book was because the whole, the theme of the book is kinship. The theme is the fact that, well, you, the, the word that I noted here, Claire, one of the first key words that you said in your presentation was, we are disconnected. And to me, compassion is about connection with people. But uh, Father Greg Boyle is talking about, it's even more than connection. It's more than just, you know, me and AJ are separate people kind of on separate journeys and let's help each other it's more of like no AJ success is my success it's kinship and that's something that uh, I try uh, myself personally try to inject in the work that we do every single day and I tell my team that my colleague Marlene who's leading our micro microfinance programs uh, she's doing a lot of work with with entrepreneurs street vendors uh, entrepreneurs at the bottom of the pyramid who uh, perhaps are not as sophisticated as other sort of more accomplished you know more revenue generating entrepreneurs and they tell her listen when you talk to folks when you work with them you have to literally feel what they're feeling and try to, to put, put, uh, try to put yourself in their shoes and that's something that since I've been here and kind of looking at the curriculum and looking at mindfulness specifically and it seems like as I'm, as I'm looking on the internet and looking at all these articles and discussions and people putting mindfulness out there, that's really like mindfulness is kind of this feel good thing. But how do we, how do we take mindfulness, like what you were saying, how do we take it out of kind of ourselves and help say, for example, like a policymaker, like someone on the LA City Council, how do we help them to kind of get into the shoes of these, the vendors that are out there to help them kind of have some understanding of, of uh, or develop some compassion towards the, the, the struggle of, of these of these vendors. How do we do that? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, well, I mean, I think, oh, go ahead, please, friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, my, so, yeah, in the context of street vending in particular, this issue of mindfulness and compassion and empathy is really at the heart of it because essentially this policy issue has brought out some really vitriolic opposition and it's very big business interests who are very fearful. And they're, I mean, we've studied the demographic, it's an informal economy, so it's hard to understand who we're talking about, but we've taken a look to our best of our abilities and we're really talking about older women between their 40s and 70s, many of them immigrant women who, couldn't find work in the traditional or in the formal economy and so created a job for themselves and are taking care of their families that way. I mean, what's more real and compelling and, and heart stirring than that? And yet it's bringing out these really, you know, um, highly resourced interests um, with so much vitriol and so much fear. And it's clear that they just, you know, they're, they're worried about trash in the streets. They're worried about competition with brick and mortar businesses. They see a problem. When they see street vendors, they see a problem. And what I think Rudy and I have discovered along the way is that there's challenges. Sure, there's challenges to legalizing street vending, but the solution is not sticking your head in the ground and hoping that street vendors go away. Street vendors are us. They are our, they are our neighbors and they are fellow Angelinos. And so I think the call to the heart has been really important. It's like, and we've had some interesting, especially Rudy <laughs> has had some interesting kind of like peacemaking conversations with the opposition, where it was really about like, hey, look, you've got concerns. That's real. I'm gonna listen to your concerns. I wanna understand them. 
how can we create a policy solution that, that addresses your concerns? Because we need to move forward. We can't, we can't just hope that this whole group of people, and we wouldn't, like, why would we want that? Why would we want a world where we're just continuing to deny and other and marginalize and push into the shadows working people, families, grandmothers? Why would we want that world? And so I feel like there's this call to the heart that is critical to being able to think about a solution, a way forward, and an addressing of real concern, you know, which is hard. Like, I get really triggered. I think we get triggered because it's like, dang, there's such a lack of compassion. But you have to meet people where they're at and show up and be present. And that's mindfulness, too, because if we approach those meetings from the standpoint of like, y'all are full of shit, <laughs> excuse my language, but like, you know, I mean, maybe behind closed doors we may be like, man, jerks. But face to face, we have to sit and bear witness to each other and say, yeah, OK, you, you have challenges and concerns. I hear you. And it's the I hear you that opened up a conversation. And I think real change lives in that. I think that's the most difficult piece of any advocacy effort, is that piece where you have to sit with somebody that's different and listen to what they have to say and really, truly be sincere about it. And I think most people don't want to do that part because it's the hardest part. Um, but I think uh, part of the, the work of, that we're doing in the LA Street Vendor campaign is um, trying to figure out how we could move people. And um, one of the, the godfathers of modern organizing, Saul Linsky, in, in his book Rules for Radicals, talk, talks about one of the, the principal, uh, the, the, the important tips is, is really tapping into the self-interest in somebody. That's how you organize. And so that's mindfulness to me. It's empathy. It's about, OK, well, what does Claire really care about? What, where is she coming from? Does she have some sort of a trauma from her childhood that makes her hate street vendors or whatever it is? You know? <laughs> or you know, where, what's their background? For example, uh, there's one councilman who has a background in, in law enforcement. That's really important to know and to be like, OK, cool. That maybe, what, did, what did he experience? And how can we relate to that? How can we find the kinship together? And so that's the real work. And it's very draining and it's very emotional. And we come back, and Claire is one of the few people that I call, and I'm like, dude, that was the toughest thing, dude, ever. I, you know, I feel so drained. I feel like I'm a therapist to these people, and then they're not giving me anything back. <laughs> but it's like we have to regenerate and move forward. It's it's, it's real work. Well, that's interesting because when because I'm on the I'm on a city council in my city, and 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 I'm the mayor this year, and so. Generally, what happens is when, when people have an issue, they'll come to the dais, and they'll start screaming and yelling at us. And then they'll sit down, right? That's not productive for anybody, because now I'm very uncomfortable, because somebody has just yelled at me, and I'm just trying to do something good. Um, and they're frustrated because we're frustrated, and we can't do anything right now about it, right? And so there's that, there's that moment where you know, you, uh, you may have feel inspired or you want to actually do something about this problem, but how do you get past this, this hurdle that you're going to come up with where you're going to be face to face with somebody or some body or some where that, that does not agree with you or is somehow not listening to you? So as someone that really wants to change something, how do you, how do you, you know, go through that and say, how did you learn or how did you that you have to kind of sit back and say, I gotta call Claire, mm -hmm. or I gotta, you know, I've gotta do something, it, otherwise I can't keep going. I mean, how, did, how, did that, how does that process work? Because we learn from experiences, you know? It's like, um, I, I certainly learn from my mom a great deal. Uh, you know, I think, um, I think reading, spirituality, and, you know, having a, I don't know, connecting with people that are like-minded, where you could be like, hey, what do you think? Well, how can it be my, be my best self, you know? Sometimes I, if, if I connected with AJ and then I'm like, he, he saw me have a bad day. You know, the best friends are the ones that say, you know what, dude, you could probably do better than that. <laughs> Don't ever do that again. <laughs> and then you kind of just learn. I think that having an, uh, an eagerness to learn and improve yourself, I don't know. I, it's just, uh, to me, I really leverage my, my friend network, you know, my close friends, and that it sort of helped me and pushed me. I think that self-awareness plays into that because when you're in these situations where whether, you know, it's like, like, like you said, with, with your, with your, these are experiences that you've had from, from the sandbox when you were a kid, disagreements, it's just, if you can maintain that sense of uh, self-awareness and empathy and presence and 
you know, have, scale that be be as kind and compassionate and, and empathetic across the board, whether you're dealing with policymakers all the way down to the people that you're helping on the street, whether it's street vendors or just, you know, hungry people in general. If you maintain that sense, um, you know, you have the ability to inspire people just by just through your individual actions. And as 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 difficult as that might be to scale, if you maintain that consistently across the board, inevitably you'll start to get through to the people that you know you're you're hoping to influence. Victor, you mentioned that a lot of the literature or conversations around mindfulness are sort of a feel good thing, and that struck me because I think as one deepens the mindfulness practice, it's about making friends with discomfort and realizing you're never going to be fully comfortable. You're, there's never going to be like happy-go-lucky land where everyone's like, kumbaya, because life is so uncertain. And so making friends with the discomfort is what I think allows us to sit at the table with people who are oppositional to our perspective. Um, it, because if it was just too jarring, then we wouldn't even make it. We would just be that person screaming at you, and you're just trying to get something done. And so are they. They want something good to happen too. And yet, there's a just total disrupt, you know? And the other thing that comes to mind, thinking of your story, is I found that interacting with elected officials in particular, that they're, um, they're used to people interacting with them by in a way that's elevating their stature. So it's like we give our power away and we give them more power than us. And we do that both, yeah, and it's deep. It's it's so deep, that's, so, that's the way that they're used to that. And they're used to it in the form of like reverence, but they're also used to it in the form of antagonism. That's another way of giving our power away is like just screaming at someone, right? And so I find that when I, to sort of look into the eyes of a city council member and try to connect to them as a human, like, you're cool, you're just as cool as anyone here, you know? Um, and I see you and I'm guessing that the fact that you ever even ran for elected office is because you really do care on some level. Like, you might be caught up in the whole system and, you know, fully yourself at this point, but I know why you got into it. Not you, Victor, I'm not talking to you. You're obviously a no, heartfelt I, person. I love the trappings of being called mayor, so no. Yeah. But you know what I mean, No, right? no, absolutely, to I, I totally it's, understand It's that. ego, it, 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 it's, there's all totally of us struggle with that. Right? And absolutely. so when you like, when someone interacts with you on a very real level, it's, it's refreshing. Right. And I, I feel that way with city council members in LA in particular, like, they like that. They're like, oh, you're talking to me like a human. Right. That's well, novel. Well, people think, you know, you're right. And I, and I had this discussion with, with Max and, and uh, last night and Christina, Cynthia, sorry, Cynthia last night. Um, that we've abdicated our power, right? Right, and 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 I think that uh, you know, there's so, I've I've handed out my business card and campaign flyers to every single person in my city, with my cell phone number on it. Does anybody call me? No, mm -hmm. nobody calls me. As and I don't think I'm a I'm an intimidating, unapproachable person, <laughs> but nobody wants to talk to me. But if, if we have something, if, if there's a, a construction going out on their, in front of their uh, house on the driveway and it's impeding their ability to, to get out of their driveway and drive, drive to work, uh, I'll get a flood of emails and calls about that. Mm -hmm. But I won't get a call when it's time to talk about how do we spend our $9 million of budget every year. So, but that's a different story. That's a whole other panel of me. So, but I, I want to bring back the focus here. So, so what do you think, uh, maybe I asked the question, and I was a little bit too, you know, too academic with my question, but so what, what are the skills? Let's, what, let's talk about skills. Like, so when you're in the room, and I think you mentioned a little bit, Rudy, what, what skills do you need to have in terms of, you know, how you communicate with people? How do you, how do you cross that divide? How do you, how do you bring people together? You mentioned self-interest, Saul Linsky. I love Saul Linsky. So, I mean, but how do you do that? How do you say, how do you get at people's self-interest? How do you help them feel comfortable in saying, you know, I am, you know, we really need to work together even though we may think differently about this. You know, Victor, thank you for sharing your, your personal uh, experiences because, um, and this is kind of queued up and uh, this will queue up my answer, but I don't know if you guys read Steve Jobs' biography by Walter Isaacson, um, but he talks about it when he was a young kid, Steve Jobs, he was like 12 or 13, he was a teenager, a young teenager, and he, he was trying to create some kind of like 
electronic thing, some basic transistor. And he just called the CEO of Atari. He looked in the white pages and just called them up and said, hey, dude, can I get this part here? And the, the CEO picked up because people don't go. <laughs> and the CEO was like, who are you? And he's like, oh, I'm Steve Jobs. I'm 13. And I'm trying to create this thing. And he's like, huh, OK. Like, yeah, sure. I'm going to get you the part. <laughs> and then it's sort of like, and I think that one of the key skills is having a sense of confidence in yourself. And I see this, unfortunately, with um, that I think about a lot when I work with youth, if I'm invited to a school or anything like that, because what I see, uh, especially in um, with students of color, that you'll say like, um, hey, uh, you know, hey, uh, hey, Juan, and then what do you think about this? And usually what they do is this. They say, me? Even though there's nobody behind them, they always look behind, like, it can't be me that you're calling on. And it's like, yeah, dude, I'm calling on you. <laughs> And I think the first thing that I try to do is try when I meet with somebody that has quote unquote more power is to try to be like, listen, I'm I'm supposed to be here. I I, I deserve to be here. And this is these are all things that happen in my head, by the way, because I'm not conditioned to think this way. So it's like a coaching of pumping myself up, like, okay, I'm supposed to be here. Um, everything's gonna be cool. I'm gonna I'm not gonna say anything stupid. I'm gonna, I'm I'm awesome already. I'm enough. <laughs> Uh, so that's like a really key thing, and sometimes I listen to rap music, you know, getting pumped up for a meeting. I mean, you know, that's an important skill, though. And the, second, the second thing uh, is um, they're all like all the things that I really am about, like simplicity. So I'm always like on time. I'm always prepared with an agenda. I, I always try not to take more than 15 minutes of their time, and I always try to finish with an ask. So it's all like these little basic things. Victor, I don't know if that's answering your question, but and I also always try to um, to come dressed decently. So like people make fun of me because of my white Converse. My, I, I always wear white sneakers, and so one of the things that I try to do, I'm telling you guys on my business, is I always try to make sure that they're super clean. That if I'm gonna rock sneakers into an important meeting, they have to be super clean. And that's something that I learned from an old friend of mine. She told me, Rudy, even if you have one shirt, just make sure that shirt's the cleanest shirt and it's always ironed, dude, when you roll up, you know? And um, I took that lesson from people like her. I took it like, I took that from heroes like Malcolm X, who I, you just see images of him rolling up to police stations looking like the best dressed dude on the street and saying, hey, I, I deserve to be here and I need you to release my friend who's locked up, you know? And that's, I, uh, anyways, those are some of the things that I think about when I'm preparing. To Rudy's point, it, it's definitely how you package it, right? I mean, for, for, for the work that we do, um, we package it as fun, right? We create this event that you would want to be a part of, something that you would fear missing out on if you weren't there. We make it the, the hottest party that's going on at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Um, but but by, by taking the same ideals of like the same way you would launch a new pair of sneakers or the same way you would launch a new single or a movie, we market it that way um, and we make it very organic. You make it extremely fun and cool and easy and accessible and you drop the barriers because there's a lot of myths that people feel that in order to, to whether it's donate your time or do anything socially active, that it's, you have to hit a home run with every single effort. Mm -hmm. You have to sacrifice your entire life and become a public servant. It's gonna cost you a lot of money. Um, you're afraid that the way that it's gonna look, there might be something better to do. But when you disarm people and you provide value to them and you give them ownership of the results, that's a big thing, right? So if one person comes, it's like, you know, we, we average about 1,500 meals whenever we do these events um, across every market. And you look at every, how many meals did you make today? Uh, I made about thirteen. No, you make fifteen hundred. You have a you have a you have ownership in the result. So if, if you give everybody, and you don't make anybody feel guilty for not being a part of it, and you but you make them feel bad for it if they don't want to be a part. You know, like <laughs> not intentionally, but it's something that is like, wow, I just missed out on the coolest thing ever. Um, so you know, to to everyone's point, it's just making it cool to be kind. Um, the same way you would market anything else. I'm yeah, just from a skill standpoint, I'm really interested in reactions. Like when we have a really strong reaction to something or when we observe that someone else is having a very strong reaction. Um, and it speaks to what Rudy was talking about, like what's behind that, what's the story? And we don't know what other people's stories are, although we can just sort of open our hearts to the possibility that there's a real story there. Like they wouldn't be so angry if there wasn't some story. 
um, or perhaps it's their social conditioning and their upbringing and um, you know as a very small child they didn't have a choice in that and you know even if I disagree and I'm angry about it now they were conditioned in a certain kind of way but we do have control over our own reaction so I just try to pay attention as a skill when I have a reaction whether it's sadness or anger um, or envy that I make a note of that and I try to trace it back and spend some time with the feeling inside of it because um, if we're just reacting all the time, we're not going to be effective. So to be an effective change maker, you have to have emotional intelligence and that kind of self-awareness and understand that we're bringing all of our fears, our traumas, our childhood issues, blah, 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 you know, it, everywhere we go. And it's up to us to work through that. And so our work gives us a lot of valuable data about where we're at. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, just to add on to what AJ and Claire said that, um, I also, you know, there was a meeting that we had maybe a couple months ago. Claire was in, we were with this uh, meeting with this elected official about street vending and getting them to, uh, you know, support us. And this street, uh, this guy was not about to support our campaign. He, you know, said it in the press, not going to support it. So my approach usually is, not, I'm, my mission is sometimes not even to change the person's mind. Is like, I, you know, we want folks to see us and honor us who we who we are. So sometimes I, you got to do that back too. And so with this person, we ended up saying, you know what, sir, we disagree, and it's all good. <laughs> you know, can you help us out with this smaller ask? And he was like, yeah, I could totally do that. And that was enough for that. And even with, uh, with opponents, we try to really honor them and, you know, where they are, because what we want is to have a longer-term relationship that eventually, hopefully, they'll, they'll come to our side as well. Obviously, what our agenda is, but but it doesn't have to be all one time. Some people go into me and they say, "We only got ten minutes with this person. We got to do everything. Home run. We got to hit the home run." Sometimes it's just a single or a bunt, you know, a pop fly. Right. You know what right. I mean? Right. So, <laughs> well, I think it's, it's interesting because I think again, it kind of goes back to the aspect of compassion. If you can, if you can treat the other person as a human being, all of a sudden those preconceptions that you may have about whoever your opponent is, right? Like, we're, like I'm psyching myself up, up for battle here, right? And you see the, the person across the table as your opponent rather than another human being that right. you could just kind of chat with and, and figure out kind of where they're coming from. So when you're able to kind of approach them in that way, then those barriers come down and you can say, okay, let's, where do we, where can we really go with this ask? Right, that, that will be comfortable for you. So, we've talked already about change and you've all been involved in, in, in change and implementing change and managing change. And, and, and so I'm really interested in finding out from you, how do you, what, what do you think are the most important things that, that we should all know from your experience about change? about not just about how you get how you implement change but but how you manage change how do you how do you ensure that your change is going to be sustainable that there's always going to be whether you're involved in this or not that someone's going to be taking on the mantle and that this will continue that what you're doing i think that in order to create sustainable change, you have to think of your efforts, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, you have to think of it as a business. And you have to be able to, you know, create the same division of labor in order to, you know, effectively tackle these issues that have frankly been around since the beginning of time. One of our hashtags is hunger is stupid as it pertains to hunger because it's not like there's not enough resources or, you know, the, the need is, you know, just, it's just disconnected, right? So if you start to approach these problems, and you, you start to you know start to think of them differently and build sustainable infrastructures in order to be able to support it. Just like you'd have a you know a call center, a customer service center for if you're a big corporation that's you know pushing products. I, I think it's extremely important to think of it in terms of you know that way rather than just something that that's fueled by your passion. One of my favorite uh, phrases or whatever maxims about leadership is that leaders build leaders. And um, I don't know, I feel like nothing will ever be sustained if humanity 
doesn't have transformative a transformative experience of a shift in consciousness and that really requires all of us and we talk a lot about education or awareness building which i think is very important but if you don't have a transformative experience I mean, we hear it we live in the information age so we're exposed to information and data all the time and if we're not having a personal transformative experience of that information it doesn't sit with us you know, I mean, day in and day my Facebook feed, I'm like, oh my God, there's always 50 articles that I need to read and I have them open on my window, you know, the window's open <laughs> for like two weeks and then my computer shuts down and I'm like, I never read, read the article. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we could read it, articles ad nauseum. The point is how it lands with us. Um, and I think leadership development is something that should be at the center of social change work always. Um, building power. Each one of us is inherently powerful. And so I'm interested in creating experiences where people get to experience their power in a new way. I didn't give it to them. That's why even the term empowerment is a little problematic because there's this notion of like, I'm going to give you power. I don't give anybody power. Everybody's pow Everyone has power. I'm here to bear witness to your power and I'm here to co-create an experience where you get to experience your power in a new way. And that, you know, that unlocking of the capacities that are inherent to every person, particularly when we look at, you know, historically disenfranchised or oppressed communities and prioritizing our efforts in those communities, um, our kin in those communities, I, I feel like that's really important. Like bearing witness to power that is already there, starting with the awareness that that power is deeply present. Um, and yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that's important. Well, that, and that, and to, to your point, I mean, that creates sustainable solutions within us individually, which is where all of these, you know, solutions can happen. If everyone, if all of us have the self-awareness and the emotional intelligence to be able to look at ourselves and be like, I am enough. You know, I was, pe I'm petrified to sit here and talk in front of all you people, but it's, <laughs> it's amazing to be able to, to say that and to acknowledge it and to be transparent about it and share. And as long as we have the ability to be vulnerable with whatever we believe and share it, um, from a from a pure intentional standpoint, then we can move mountains together. It's a lot more than any one of us can do individually. I, I want to co-sign on. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the, the the sustainability piece and the money piece to me is really important. It's something that I think about all the time in our organization because I think the nonprofit system is completely broken. And uh, I think that the people that are doing the most transformative work to address some of these issues um, are not getting funded in the way that they should. There's something wrong, you know? And um, I also think that we have to think about new leadership. And because you always see the same leaders that are running for office, you're like, why? Again, dude, you've been like four times already. You're gonna go- Why are you look at me, Rudy? No, <laughs> not you, <laughs> but it's like part of it is also like, hey, let, let, me, let me talk to somebody else. You know, let me let me create a space for some somebody else to realize that they are also powerful and can contribute. Um, for me, uh, when it comes to change, and I and with my team, there was a there was somebody. Uh, I was at a local university a couple of days ago, and someone was like, "Rudy, I want to volunteer this summer," and I was like, "Yeah, so let's talk, and I'd love to learn what you want to do." And he's like, ah, "I'm down for whatever. I just I just want to be there." And I was like, ah, "I think you have to really be really invested with your heart to do something." You know, because you see people like in, in cities and different organizations, you could tell somebody hates their job. <laughs> and I think that's bad. Like everybody has to do what they really truly love, you know. And I think that that's part of change is, is making sure that everybody has an opportunity to find um, the work that they're supposed to be doing with their heart, you know. Right. And it seems that there are, there are so many opportunities for us as individuals to kind of find that unique space where we can do something that we love to do. I mean, you've all found that space, but maybe that's part of part of our challenge in terms of, you know, bringing everyone into this, you know, as change agents to say, you know, help help plug people into those places where they can really find like this, like the whole issue of power, where they can really experience their own power. Like this is. I would love to do something like this and, and you could plug them into something and they could really grow in, in realizing and recognizing the power that they do have. Sure. Or create something new, which is, uh, I right. relate to AJ's experience of, uh, I didn't find an organization that I truly wanted to contribute to. So I was lucky enough to help co-create something 
but that is scary in the beginning, you know? It's like, oh my God, I'm gonna do something on my own, or how's this gonna work? I've never done this before, and, but it's, you, have to cut, you have to be empowered, I guess, to do that. And I also think that we don't have to strike out on our own and be these like, you know, individual badass, like entrepreneur. I mean, that's not everybody's not path. And so what I hear and what you're saying, Victor, is like, how are we building that social infrastructure where everyone finds their role and can optimize their role? Um, because it's not about doing it on your own. Although sometimes you might find yourself doing it on your own, but really we need each other, right? right. It's the collective experience. And so I do think there's some merit in looking at our civic and social infrastructure, looking at nonprofits and some of the, the inherent flaws in that system, but trying to sort of shore up that, at the kinship networks that have already been developed and the opportunities that have already been developed and making those better. Um, yeah, I, I say that too because I think in the age of like Instagram celebrities, like there's just, ev everyone is doing their own thing, you know? And the reality is, is that we need to do things Collectively, we need to create a societal shift. So that will require team being on a team and not just being seen for our own thing. And where do you think it, where do you think these? It, it seems it seems like there needs to be a, a space. And I don't know if I'm I'm talking if I'm thinking about a, a geographic space or maybe a virtual space, but we're. Where is it that people can actually, or how do we create this space for people to kind of come together and say, you know, we, this is the, the type of society, you know, 4.0 that we want to be, you know, that, that we want to be innovative, we want to work together, uh, not, as, not as individual actors, but, a, but a, as, a, as a community. I mean, do you see things like this happening? I know in each of your organizations, I mean, that's what you're doing. I mean, you, you're bringing people together. So is there something that... We, that can be done kind of at a larger level to bring more people together that you see? I mean, I think of that as movement building. And another term that is in circulation now, and I talked about it a little bit today, is collective impact, which is this idea of essentially of nurturing the ecosystem of activity and acknowledging that different organizations, different individuals are gonna play their role and in synergy with each other, and that we need that. So no one nonprofit is gonna save the world. It's just not, that's delusional. Um, so building a, a movement of varying and diverse actors who are clear on their roles, have trust with each other, have transparency, and are coordinating efforts. In our work, sometimes we talk about the inside-outside strategy, where in the working group space, the working group ecosystem, there's organizations of all kinds. There's some that like to agitate and be out there rallying with you know, posters. That has a role. There's a time and a place for that, you know? We all can play our cards. And then the inside strategy is the diplomacy strategy, where you're sitting down, you're talking, you're, you're applying your empathy, you're trying to have that heart-to-heart -heart with the city council member who just doesn't get it. And the key is that there's coordination and trust. And maybe in the eyes of the city council member, he doesn't realize we're working together. And it's a, it's a, it's a choreography of change and it takes a lot of trust and trust only comes through real relationship building. So, I mean, that to me is the foundation of, of movement building, but that's, I think, how you start to get that scaled impact. I think all the, you know, that's, yeah, that's it. it to me, I think it's important to, uh, it's hard, but it's hard. I don't even know if I'm gonna, if that's the right answer. <laughs> so, um, I think I like to connect with people in very casual settings, you know? So like, um, so I think we need to create more safe spaces like that. Uh, so that was, uh, we had a project last year where we were uh, facilitating a group of organizations in a neighborhood in Los Angeles. And um, the client wanted them to have structured like network meetings, you know? Um, and it was like super structured, and it was really weird, and it's like you pair it up with other people, and it's like, okay, I have to sit with AJ, and I gotta talk to him about my stuff, it's weird, okay, I just wanna get out of here. <laughs> but, you know, we, we always encourage us, like, people don't act like that, we're all humans, you know? We need to have spaces that perhaps are a little bit structured, like your network meetings, Claire, but there's a lot of room for people to just be humans and connect with each other and see the self-interest in each other and, 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 uh, and, and relate. You know, I'd probably have a better conversation with AJ if we went out for a cocktail as opposed to maybe like if someone put us in a network meeting and we had to like sit there and we're all like, oh, we don't want to be here, you know? <laughs> so I think we need to think differently about how we bring people together. 
you know? It could be via the internet, it could be at the bar, it could be somewhere else, I don't know, but we have to be creative with that. It is art, it's choreography, for sure. Right. No, I like that, I like that, uh, the choreography. That's, that's a great way to, to, to envision it. Um, can I take some questions? I, does that, do people have questions here? I think we have a few minutes. We have a class called Collaboration, and we have the students doing interviews with their stakeholders, so they've identified an organization, and they have to interview all of their stakeholders that are involved in the change. And we have them doing this, but then I hear things about the, the post-earthquake Haitian um, efforts and all of the money that was wasted and all of the conversations around that, that, that the, the aid organizations went in and they interviewed the people, but the change that they were implementing wasn't effective because they didn't hear the people as much as they should have, that they imposed their own ideas about what was needed in the community rather than really listening. How do you effectively listen? Because they, they interviewed, they had notes, uh, transcribed the notes of what the communities wanted and needed, but somehow in the execution, it didn't manifest itself as the, as, as the constituents needed it. <laughs> They're all kicking each other in me there. You go, you go. <laughs> I think you want to genuinely believe that the organizations that are the, the, the middlemen, if you are, between the people who want to help and the people that need the help, um, I think you genuinely want to believe that everyone's intentions are pure. Um, assuming that they are, you know, I, th I think it just it requires a little bit more transparency on their end and holding them accountable that for, for you know, what they say that they're going to do and what they actually do and actually having a way to not in depth, it doesn't need to be a 200 page report on how you're going to do what you're going to do, but you know, just apply a little bit more effort on the front front end before you, you know, waste anyone's time, effort, and energy. Um, and help, and you know, and then the end result is people that need the help the most or end up exactly where they are or worse off. Um, and I think it's, I don't, I hate the word reporting, <laughs> but more, you know, conveying what, what was more accountability, yeah, just on the, on the, on the people that doing what they say they're going to do. You know, to me, it's uh, in addition to that really important uh, system of accountability, because sometimes we need to hold each other accountable, even if we're not, even if we're friends or we're colleagues. Um, it, it's just kind of kinship, you know? It's that perhaps, I believe that perhaps some of the people that were managing those programs didn't have a real sincere kinship with perhaps folks in that community. Um, and I think that that's something that's empathy, it's mindfulness, it's like true love for the work that you're not separate. It's not me providing a service, it's like I'm actually with you. And uh, my, I'm gonna tell a story real quickly of my colleague Marlene, put her on blast. So Marlene is really the liaison and leading um, uh, our work with entrepreneurs. So we have a micro loan fund and we have a micro equity fund that's investing in businesses in low income neighborhoods and we primarily focus on uh, entrepreneurs at the bottom of the pyramid. So these are our street vendors, these are folks in the informal economy, folks running the business out of their homes. And as you all know, we're working on a massive ca campaign with a lot of uh, organizations to legalize street vending. So Marlene is working with a lot of these vendors to get them loans so they could get equipment so they could build their businesses. So we had a rally uh, last, uh, last week in Echo Park. There was a rally. A couple hundred vendors came out to raise awareness about street vending. And that day, Marlene had a long week coaching and talking and doing underwriting with entrepreneurs. And they said, hey, Marlene, are you going to go to this thing? I'm going to go. You've had a long week. Like, you know, it's cool if you wanted to go home. And she's like, no, I'm going. Because it's not, I don't want anybody to believe. I really feel that this is super important. It's not technically part of my job, but I need to be there. And it's my name. And it's my, It's I want to be there. I want to make sure that folks know that I'm with them through whatever issues that they have to deal with because we're in it together. And it's so funny because she's a young woman, she's 25, and just the lesson that she gave me that day about kinship and about connection and about solidarity is was super key. And I think that that's something that when we think about collaboration and we think about initiatives, is that like, nah, it's not me, it's not the other, it's just us, you know? It's interesting when you say that because in my professional career as a social worker, the, what I was always taught was, you know, work is a, I leave my work at work, 
and when I go home, there, there's a, a definite split between kind of my personal life and my professional life. Mm -hmm. But now, as I, as I get older, and now in this position, I'm beginning to see these lines blur. Mm -hmm. You know, just like in your, in your example, Rudy, that, you know, what we do as professionals is, is just as important, uh, not just, it is very important to our personal lives, it feeds our personal selves, but, but those lines are, are no longer that clear, and that what I do professionally is also something that, that I can do to um, bring other people in and to, and to connect with others you know, on a personal level. I mean, what I think about in that incidence, that example, another skill to apply is humility. Um, and also self-examining in terms of one's positionality, especially in a dynamic like that, where you have international aid agencies and workers who are not Haitian or don't, you know, have never lived there before coming in. And yes, they're listening and they're transcribing, but their experience of life is so different. Um, so I, I think about that in terms of my own work too. I have to always remember who I am. I'm a white woman, I grew up in LA, lower middle class background. There are certain things, but I have college, college educated, graduate degree, all those things inform my worldview. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm wrong if I have a bright idea if in a context where I'm working with someone who has a different experience, but I have to constantly ask myself, are my bright ideas coming from my own experience or from my own point of view, from my own perspective? And am I, am I really able to hear what I'm hearing? You know what I mean? Like, am, is what I'm hearing what I think I'm hearing? And like really self-examining in that way throughout the process. Um, it requires a lot of critical self-examination. Um, but that's really fascinating, this notion that you might hear the words, but do you understand the meaning? And you may or may not, and you may or may not be the right person to understand the meaning. And in that case, you have to have the humility to know who else needs to be on your team. Great. Another question? Yeah. Hi, my name is Lydia. I'm a member of the Social Impact Program. And first of all, I just wanted to thank all of you for being here. It was such a great example in all of your stories and your comments about what we are learning, especially I've just come out of term one and mindfulness is the first core uh, course that we take. And each and every one of you spoke to so many points about that, about being present, being aware of your own uh, place in the world, which is part of social impact and human development as well. And so it was really neat to hear how all of you blend that. I did have a question about uh, listening, but that's been addressed. So my other question is, in all of the work that you do um, in, the, in the food and in the nutrition and really tackling that problem, I was just curious how some of your um, plans or maybe just desires of where you see each of what you're doing hitting into other very key industries um, beyond food. So in thinking about health, for example, more like health and wellness, and maybe what might be going on in the wellness space, some champion partners or different things that you might be seeing going on here in the US as a whole or maybe in the world. And I ask that from the perspective of, I work with a lot of college students in Arizona and in Texas, and I know that a lot of our up and coming youth are looking for their place, either as volunteers or as servant leaders or as, as professionals of how they can be tackling some of these problems. So I'm just curious what kind of relationships you might be building there. You mean in terms of career opportunities or, or service opportunities, how people can express themselves and their, their leadership in different ways? So, so an approach that, uh, that we're taking with, with our program is, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, food was not what primarily motivated me. It was just something that was, was simple for me to secure and distribute. So with, with the foundation that I started, it's actually called Living Through Giving. So as I continue to use the, our inaugural program as a way to build these communities, I have a team of volunteers um, in empowering. I like that better than empowering. Empowering all these people to wherever they are geographically in the country and the world, giving them very basic tools that are extremely simple um, and a format and a blueprint to follow to create their own experience. So that empowers them on an individual level to use their individual and collective social capital to create their own events and build their own tribes. But what, what, what's interesting is once we, once our group is able to figure out the formula and the format to make that as simple as possible. We can now 
take this format and apply it to any other social justice issue that or humanitarian issue that might exist because you know individually we can only do so much but collectively we we can do a lot i would rather inspire a million people to feed one person each than to try to feed a million people myself so the the idea of and, and then but but more importantly what the what might change it might be it might be hunger it might be homelessness it might be xyz whatever issue issues that we face but by continuing to make the intention and appeal to the intention and inspire the humanity i i don't identify i don't call it we do charity i don't call it we you know I, I call it humanity service it's not you know it's and it's by by appealing to everyone's self-interest to find that humanity in themselves and to acknowledge the humanity of the people that they're serving whatever issue it is that's, that's near and dear to their heart um the, that is the is a term that i think both of you guys are familiar with is the incremental relentlessness that goes behind every single action that we do Similar to AJ, Claire's gonna hate that I say this because she does, she always says, "Don't say that." I, I was never interested in food, <laughs> and it's so crazy that now it's like street many. We're doing a purchasing cooperative to support uh, produce deliveries to small grocers. We're doing a bunch of food related things. My lens has always been economics. I've always been interested in money since I was a kid. And um, the other major sector that our organization is really trying to tap into and, and tap into that knowledge base is finance. Um, because I believe that capital is really important and our communities don't have it. Um, and then the other major sector that uh, we're really interested in is in advocacy and policy making. But I'm super interested in the systems that, that are around policy making, like the super PACs and how do you really build power, all these things. Because I'm like, how come we don't have a super PAC? You know, like, how do we, how do, we do that? How does it work? You know, and um, it's scary, but then it's also like, yeah, we need to do that work. We need to at least be knowledgeable of what's happening because these are the things that are influencing how people live in our in our communities. A space that I, th I feel like I'm neighboring and orbiting around in this way that I didn't expect is the world of folks who are really interested in active transportation and transforming um, street environments to really honor the human body, get us walking and biking and feeling safe. And we're all, you know, there's like this mutual curiosity and crush thing going on between food advocates and active transportation advocates because we both care about healthy communities and we're seeing it from sort of a systems built environment lens. And an, an issue that's emerging for all of us is this notion of how do we create investments, bricks and mortar infrastructure investments in neighborhood environments to support health and do that in a way that doesn't promote displacement and gentrification. And so, you know, the bike advocates, advocating for bike lanes and walk, walking advocates advocating for you know bump outs and safer streets have seen the res that that can contribute towards and make more rapid gentrification similarly you know the joke is when the $11 hamburger hits town like look there goes the neighborhood and that food good food can be the canary in the coal mine for gentrification even though we know all communities deserve these services and so that's a real conundrum that we're we're facing together, and I think there's a real space that's opening up to create common cause for healthy development without displacement. So this morning, I heard you talk about empowerment. I, I heard the importance of respect, about compassion and empathy. Uh, we even heard about the power of fun, you know, best party going on at 10 a.m. on Sunday. We heard about collaboration. We've heard about simplicity. And so, actually, I'd like to start really with, with Claire and Rudy. Were there, were there any values that I missed there, do you think? I could add one. I mean, inherent connection, you know, an assumption of inherent connection as a value, a guiding principle. Okay, so define inherent connection for us. Like, that sounds cool. <laughs> I want to hear more. Well, this notion that we're all in it together, and I think Rudy may have said something to the effect of, you know, if AJ succeeds, I succeed, you know? So this idea that, you know, our kin winning is us winning, and there's no, there's no separation. We're, we're, we're in this together, and so we want to lift all boats. Well, what I was going to add, Stan, is that one of the things that drives my work a great deal is anger. And um, it could be anger typically can be a very destructive uh, force and a destructive emotion, and you see a lot of angry people when we encounter them, and typically... You see someone that's angry, usually they do something bad. And I think I get really angry at what's happening, 
you know, and the numbers that Claire showed in her presentation, I'm really upset about that. Like it hits me, like internally I get emotional about that. And so I think that the, what, that drives my work. The best, the, when I do really good work, that's like when I'm emotionally invested in it. And a lot of times it's because I'm pissed because I want it to be different. And so then the other piece of the work is like, how do you modify it and make sure that you're channeling it in a constructive way? But that's something that I think about a lot is, man, I'm really mad. <laughs> it's, not, it's not supposed to be that way. How do you keep that anger from becoming destructive then in what you're trying to do? Because I know as a young leader on my journey, I would get angry about things that I felt like were wrong and would just make a mess. Reading Brene Brown. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it's really just understanding. I don't know. I think it's um, I think it's just my friends. It's reading. It's it's thinking about you know how do I use that energy in a different way, um, and how can I be constructive? I mean, even just now we we're laughing at lunch, everybody that um, I was looking for water. And, uh, and I saw the sodas over there. And I think because of the way that I grew up, I'm sort of addicted to sugar. I'm having a cookie right now. <laughs> but I saw the soda, the Coca-Cola over there, and I was like, oh my God, I want a Diet Coke. And I was like, no. And the reason why is because I was angry at the 15 million people that are getting diabetes. And I remember the number that Claire put up there, and I was pissed because the other uh, vision that I have is Coca-Cola. The, there's new Coca-Cola tents that are, are popping up at the farmer's markets on the east side where my office is located in Los Angeles. Selling and peddling sh uh, you know, sugar-free soda to our kids in an environment that where a, a majority of them are obese and overweight. They're killing our kids. And that makes me mad getting chills right now. So when I saw that soda, I was really angry and I was like, I'm just not going to have that soda. <laughs> Where's the water at? And I saw Stan and we were laughing about it. And I was like, you know, we were laughing, but I was like, no, dude, I'm seriously, you know, voting with my, with my choice here. <laughs> Patty and, and Tiffany, tell us a little bit about what, what you're doing in the community and help us understand some of the values that guide your work. Some of the values that guide our work are also dignity and respect, treating people with dignity and respect, and also adding value to people's lives, leaving some sort of impact on them, no matter how minor or major it may be, but having the person leave you with some sort of way to make them better, to add value to their lives and, and in whatever way it may be possible. And my Friends House Foundation, we service primarily the Skid Row community of Los Angeles, which happens to be the nation's capital of homelessness. It, Skid Row is the home of the largest concentration of homelessness in the US. Um, we started in 2008. To date, we've served over 85,000 individuals and families. Let's see what else about My Friend's House Foundation. Um, we are a volunteer-based organization. And when I say volunteer-based, I truly mean that in every essence of the word. We, um, me, the founder, as well as the volunteers, no one is paid. It's all volunteered. It's all a labor of love. Um, and our mantras are live to give and feeding people both physically and spiritually. We're, we're unique in that our staff is not, we only have nine staff and we're not directly working with the people that are receiving the food that we provide. We're sort of the middleman. So we're serving over 250 agencies in LA and in Orange County and beyond. We're starting to expand as we get new donors, uh, new food donors, but we are, you know, compassion is key and dignity for sure. And we find that a lot of people who could be getting food, who could be signing up for CalFresh, it's really dignity that's keeping them from taking advantage of these resources. So we're, we're really now at the point where we're trying to collaborate within our agency base and see where can you kind of leverage all your resources, know what everybody else is serving and who they're serving in, in the community and take advantage of your neighbor, your pantry around the corner. If you're serving food, uh, do you need to be giving out clothes to or is someone doing that really well? So we're really trying to work together and build the sense of community, not only with our volunteers, but within our agencies and among our donors. And one of the things that we do that really is unique or niche to a food bank, which we call ourselves more of a food recovery agency, is that 
we're not warehousing food. We're not handing out food directly. All our food is going from the donor, like a Ralph's grocery store, directly to one, two, or three different shelters or pantries. So it's kept fresh, and people appreciate that. And it's the food that might, you know, salads that are at the grocery store that are prepared and packaged that might get thrown away, but they have another day or two or three's worth of uh, freshness. And, you know, we're trying to kind of come in where some of the bigger food banks might be taking the canned goods or the other food and go through the deli. We'll take all the fresh food. We can take that and get it somewhere immediately. Whereas, you know, some of the other larger organizations have to bring it back, sort through it, and then take it out. So that's kind of where we're at. And we're serving over 250 pantries in, in 40 or more communities right now. You know, when we think about ethical leadership, and, and I, I try to talk about this stuff with folks, again, a lot of this is really fuzzy, right? And how do you express this? And so as I try to think about what is, what is that simplest definition of ethical leadership, I often suggest the idea that it's, it's being accountable to something larger than yourself, and that we find meaning when we do that. And especially as you're leading volunteers, how is it that you're able to help them be motivated to connect with something larger than themselves, to find meaning, purpose, fulfillment, when you're not able to give them a, a, a monetary uh, incentive? What are you able to connect your volunteers with? The unique thing about My Friend's House is it affords volunteers an opportunity to give back um, last minute spontaneously. For instance, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I was volunteering at a few of the missions and I found that I had to fill out an eight page application. In some instances, I would have to be fingerprinted. In addition to that, when I would call, let's say on a Monday, if I wanted to volunteer the next day, they would tell me that their list is full and that I would have to wait another week or two weeks or however long to volunteer. But with my friend's house, people are actually able to just come down and enjoy the hassle-free um, giving. We have a few volunteers we just honored uh, at our 25th anniversary who were, they've been with us since 1989, and they are still with us. And these are the same people that are now bringing in their kids and their grandkids to help out at events where we have volunteer opportunities. So they're teaching them at the young age, like I do with my kids, come help at a food drive, come help at the office, you know, whatever you can do. And it's, it's coming from a place of understanding what it is people are going through. Some of them are students who have lived in their cars and they know what it's like to struggle and, you know, just barely get by. And they're sharing their time because they've been there. So a lot of that I think is probably the same with Tiffany's group. They've experienced that and they don't, they have the compassion, they don't want other people to have to stay that way permanently. So there's no such thing as wasted food and there's no such thing as a wasted effort, right? And there's no such thing as wasted people either. So it's, you know, just kind of bringing everything back together. Um, but I, I feel like both of you spoke to um, every effort matters, you know, and everyone should easily and freely be able to give and to share their love with the with the world. Um, and the, n none of that is for naught, you know, there's no wa wasted effort. So I just wanted to. So talk with us about maybe some of the unique leadership challenges that you guys go through, since I'm kind of coming from that leadership perspective. Can you share with us, uh, obviously not in, in great detail, but how do you tap into the resources that are needed to overcome the obstacles in your own leadership journey or those, those barriers that get in the way? I've become a great manager of personalities. <laughs> um, we have so many personalities, so many groups of people who volunteer from celebrities to actually individuals who were homeless, people that we actually served, they were in our line, and they were once on the receiving end, and they have, through the help of my friend's house, they say, as a positive um, reinforcement or positive image for them, they have now been transformed and 
are now in the giving side. So once they were receiving, now they're giving. Um, so you never know what a person has gone through their life's journeys. So I found that you really have to be mindful, there's that word again, as well as thoughtful. And I found that if your heart is in it, and that's what I believe the volunteers um, have in common, we have, um, we're driven by matters of the heart. So even though one may want to do something different than the other, um, we are mindful of the fact that it's not about us. It's about the community, the community that we're serving. And so I guess I could say we've kind of all had our own psychology 101 kind of in the whole um, process of My Friend's House Foundation which is just learning and appreciating the differences of each other. What I heard you say so beautifully, Tiffany, is it's not about us. So somehow we have to have the, the humility, I think it's another value, right, to, uh, to connect, to listen, and, and to not just get stuck in our own solutions. Leading without letting any kind of ego get in the way is highly important. And collaboration is key. I mean, working with all the organizations, being here, being able to see what others are doing and really, you know, obviously everybody wants the same outcome. So really talking about as a group, as a community, as a state, where we're going. And the only other thing that came to mind is being a leader with a board because I hadn't worked with a nonprofit, that's probably the biggest challenge is trying to bring everybody else along with me that's on my board and make them stay motivated because we're out there doing the work and we're just working. And then we want to engage this 10, 12, or 20 other people to support us. So learning to do that while I'm just doing my everyday job with my regular staff, that's probably the biggest challenge for me coming, coming in at that point. There's a couple of things that came to mind when you asked that, Stan. The first one is that in order to really impact change, you, it's I, I don't feel like we've, um, sometimes we haven't, the solutions haven't been created yet. And so you have to, um, one of the biggest challenges is being alone. Being the first or saying, you know what, everybody's doing that way. I'm going to, I think we have to go this way. And no one's going to come right now. I'm going to be up by myself, but I, this is what we have to do. And I think that there's a loneliness to the work that we do. Um, and Claire and I have talked about, you know, organizing, we still got to do that, of organizing a, a little group of executive directors, almost like a therapy session, because, <laughs> yeah. because it's very lonely. It's very lonely. And so when I encounter other people that are like, you know, doing their, you know, leaving their organization or starting one, I'm always like, hey, you can always give me a call if you have a question about some random form that the government sent you, or like, you don't know how to work with your staff or you're having an issue with your board because I find it sometimes I'm like who do I talk to about this stuff like it's very you know it's that you're by yourself you know yeah following up on this idea of feeling alone and the ego element and how to sort of interact with that the ego the ego has two favorite expressions one is like arrogance and the other is self-deprecation it's it's the same thing it's ego um, and I am my worst critic I am so self-critical, and that internal critical dialogue is always there. And it especially comes up when I do public speaking, actually. <laughs> I get really nervous, and I just think I'm going to fail, and everyone's going to hate me, and who am I to say, who am I to be in this position to be speaking, and blah, 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 blah. So pause. OK. You did a great job. This oh, morning. thank you. <laughs> um, but thinking about strategies, I try to connect myself to this notion that it's not about me, and it is about the work. And also, I, I pray for humility, and I pray to be of service. So whatever comes out of my mouth, that, it's, that it helps somebody or something. And that's not about me. That just, it's of service. I mean, if I'm going to expend my energy, that it's going to do some good in the world, and that I have a good time. So every time I do public speaking, I go through that little sort of mantra within myself, you know, may I have a humble heart, may I be of service, and may I enjoy myself, because if I enjoy myself, it'll be enjoyable for all of you, right? <laughs> so those are some of the, the strategies I try to employ when the ego just starts to crunch on me too hard. I found that it's 
it's imperative to have a team that is balanced. And what I mean by that is you, in my opinion, you should have people who are the ones who are a little less risky, the ones who want to go by the book with everything, the ones who want to have a year to plan events, that sort of thing. At the same time, that should be coupled with people who, if you come up with an idea right now, you have those people who, once they leave this seminar, they're ready to go out and implement it. They're ready to go into action. So for my friend's house, it's been um, a challenge, but we, we're working on that, on finding that healthy balance for, for our particular organization. My board is a crazy board. Like they're like real crazy. They're all in a good way. And sometimes they actually disagree with me. And so people in the field sometimes will be like, well, that person doesn't even agree with, or they're conservative or, you know, they, they, why are they doing that? And I'm like, yeah, I actually disagree with them too. And we get into big fights, you know, with, you know, uh, behind closed doors, but I need them because they add a value, a different perspective that I don't see. And we were just whispering when you were saying about like the, the people that we work with on our teams that are the big planners. And sometimes I, I get them, I'm like, ah, let's just get it done today. We got to get it done today. But then at the same time, when you get through that, you're like, oh man, they're right. We got to take it easy. And then, you know, it's, it's so important. But that also, Tiffany, to me, is takes a lot of um, to, to let go of the ego that you don't need anybody else, you know? And I think I, I see a lot of leaders, unfortunately, they don't even hire the best because they're concerned that that person's going to take over or whatever. And um, ah, that's when we fail. That's when we already, we're setting ourselves up to fail for hiring people and bringing people together that are not as, just to lift your own self up. I'm hearing you guys say it's okay to have people that you're collaborating with, collaborating with who don't necessarily agree with you. And the messiness of the process is okay. And it's you're not a failure as a leader if there's messiness. That actually that's just part of the gig. Knowing that you're, you're addressing a room full of people who are all trying to make at least some small change happen in their current context. And, and for a lot of these folks, this is a new way of looking at life, a new way of doing things. Because you all have experience as change makers, what advice can you give us today? How, do you, how would you help us take the next step, knowing that you're, you're talking to a room full of folks who are all trying to make some small change in their own context? If you start with one person, it can grow from there. I don't think you need to think too huge. I think you just need to have, <clears throat> excuse me, compassion and passion for what you're doing, and that will drive your change. Um, I was telling Stan right before we were up here that we, we've been getting contacted by people internationally, and just one single person, I had a student in Slovenia who's doing a study on food recovery from Slovenia, and she's studying at a university in Sweden online, and she's trying to figure out what can I do? And even somebody in India contacted us, and there's people all over, individuals that contact us across the country. They want to do what we're doing, one person at a time. Mm -hmm. So I think if you reach out thinking, if I can just help one person, maybe they, they can help people in addition and pass it on, or maybe it'll grow, but don't think too big. This, I don't know why it popped up in my mind, but like uh, maybe a, a year ago, um, a few years ago, I did a little presentation at a elementary school. It was like a kindergarten class. And it was really towards the parents. It was like their graduation. And uh, one of the, the principal invited me to come and talk to the parents about my experience going to college and encouraging the parents. Uh, and it was uh, in Spanish, so I had to really be on my game. And uh, you know, I did it and it was fine. And then uh, maybe like a year ago, I was getting my car out of this parking structure in LA. And then the man that was running the, the parking structure with the ticket and stuff was like, I know you. And I was like, oh, hey, what's up? You know, and he's like, I've seen you around. He said, did you do a presentation at a school, at this school? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I remember your presentation and what you said. And it just struck me for the whole day that I had this random interaction with the parking attendant. And he's like, I remember what you said and I remember what you were saying about uh, our role in helping our kid go to school. And it just, it really kind of like centers you on, you know, 
what this is about sometimes. And it really is about the process. I have a hard time with it because I'm like, we need a revolution. We need a different political system. We need money in low-income neighborhoods. But then at the end of the day, it's like, maybe it's just about how we interact with each other, you know? The first thing that came to my mind when I think about how do we, you know, what's my advice for change makers is change yourself. You have to. There's no opting out of that. Um, and it's going to be messy, it's going to be uncomfortable, you're going to have to go to your shadow places, frankly. I mean, that's just, we have huge shadow places in our society, these huge dysfunctions where we're harming our community members, right? I mean, we're creating harm to each other and the planet. We have to be engaged in a process of being willing to look at that within ourselves too um, and know that we're a part of that and and I don't say that in any trite way I actually genuinely believe that if we are changing ourselves and working through our own shadows that we that creates ripple effects because it changes our relationship with everyone in our lives and it changes our relationship to the work and how we do the work and that will have incredible ripple effects um, and that's where these new solutions that we maybe don't know yet come through um, so it's, it's definitely a, a serious undertaking, you know, but I do see people endeavoring into good work and AJ talked earlier about how he doesn't use the word charity and I appreciated that. I mean, I see, I do see people engaged in good work, but they're not engaged with themselves and I really think it limits the effectiveness of the work ultimately. We're all here today and we all have different things that we're passionate about. We all have causes that are near and dear to us. Today, we're just brought together because of food and food insecurity. Um, I would challenge everyone to discover your why. I found that your why will actually serve as your wings. So when you are lonely, as you spoke earlier, Rudy, your why will carry you through. When you have long nights, sometimes working on projects alone, your why will support you. It will keep you in motion. So I guess that's pretty much it. Just find your why because that your why will be your, your wings. They will be your best friend and keep you afloat when you do not feel like flying. Can we shift a little bit and tell us about what you do as leaders of organizations or foundations? What is it that you're thinking of? And are you looking at yourself? And because I'm coming from a, a, a background of entrepreneurship, I'm thinking in a certain way you are businesses, only not. You know, I'm not, you're not in it for money. You're in it for the value to the the better society, but you're still organizations that have a structure and you still have a direction and a strategy and you need to think about how are you gonna feed yourselves? And so can you just address that a little bit to just kind of uh, shift a, a little bit if you'd like to? Well, for an organization that's been around for almost 27 years, strategy is key. We don't even have the option of not having a strategy because our funders want to know what is your strategy. Is it a three or a five year plan? And right now we have we have a strategic plan in place that we it's evolving, um, but it's it's essential for us. And I come from a for profit background, so just winging it doesn't work for me. Um, you know, it used to be kind of run very by the seat of the pants and it was grassroots organization. So it's come a little way since then. There's a lot more structure in place. Um, and we have to think big picture because there's so much happening in food recovery and the food waste world right now. It's forcing us to really think it the big picture wise. What's happening with the entire state? What are other states doing? What is the country looking at? I mean, all the statistics, I think you guys have all seen them. So. You can't just focus on your little organization. Um, and my board is primarily from a for-profit background too, so they're looking at it the same way. Some of what I'm doing is some f level of forecasting and trying to envision where things are going to go and where there's gaps in the infrastructure. And there is a huge gap in infrastructure. And just very concretely, what was it, April 1st, uh, state policy went into effect that requires um, businesses that 
generate a certain level of food waste to enroll in organic waste recycling services, it's totally not happening because no county or city has a plan in place and there's no enforcement. And yet everyone, all the cities and counties have goals about you know 90%, 100% diversion, um, but literally we don't have the infrastructure to absorb that. So what I'm thinking about is sort of who are the ecosystem of players, the food finders of the world, et cetera, the LA composts of the world, you know, city, bureau of sanitation, how do all these actors come together in new ways to come up with an action plan for how we address this very real need? We have a law on the books now that is not in effect because we don't have the infrastructure to address it. And yet we do have a lot of pieces of the puzzle. So it's sort of putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And then um, similarly to Patty as well, our organization, this is more from an organizational development standpoint, we came, I didn't say this actually in my opening remarks, but we started as a project coming out of the mayor's office. Um, so we started with a lot of political capital. The mayor's office was convening leaders. They established the LA Food Policy Council as an independent nonprofit, separate from the city, but still housed within City Hall. So we started with a lot of oomph, and there's and a lot of energy, and people were engaged. And very organically, the ecosystem of working groups and the network and the leadership board came together. Um, I've been with the Food Policy Council for four years. I just became the ED in July. And before that, I was basically the policy director. So I'm like working every learning curve that ever existed within myself to, to figure out, you know, we're going on six years now. And how do I channel that energy of goodwill and enthusiasm and passion into a real Arch organizational architecture. And I am interested in the collective impact model. Um, and I think we talked a lot about like kind of the choreography of social change. How does that get operationalized into the organization in a way that's really clear, has integrity, is transparent, um, I, and like really just getting things on paper so people know what the protocols are. You know, the working groups have chairs. How do the chairs get selected? Or do they have terms? What are the, you know, what are the term limits? All of those things. I think we've benefited from a lot of organic creativity, um, but now it's time to kind of bring it down to planet Earth and ground it in an architecture um, for our whole organization. And um, trying to do that in a way that doesn't put us in boxes and where we're getting really rigid. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a balance. My question really comes from the standpoint of a change in our, in our business model um, when it happens to you. And if it hasn't happened, you don't have to answer this question. Uh, with our organization, we had a situation where, um, where our funding changed. Um, like literally it just changed and we had to figure out how we we're going to keep our, our business afloat. And, we, and I sat down and developed a plan, a strategic plan, to figure out how we we're going to deal with that. And I've been, just like you, Rudy, wanting to get away from grants and everything for a couple of years. And so I put together a three-year plan on that particular piece. So have you had the situation where uh, something has happened to your organization or the industry and you had to make that shift? And how did you guys handle that within the change? So how did you handle change within your industry, your funding, um, rules, regulations, or anything like that? I could speak to that. So what the initiative I described, the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network, working with mom and pop uh, grocers, that program of the Food Policy Council actually started at our city's redevelopment agency. And for those of you who are from California, you'll know we don't have redevelopment anymore. So the very last year of the existence of the redevelopment agency in LA, they started the Community Market Conversion Program, which was bringing $75,000 facade improvement grants to corner stores to help them remake themselves as healthy food retailers. And I mean, to these small business owners, 75K to redo their facade and buy them some new refrigeration and shelving was game changing. To the redevelopment agency, it was nothing. You know, they're like, oh, we do this in our sleep. Oh, great, wonderful. Um, and our, you know, my, I was involved in that program and I was very interested in the leadership development aspect of it because I knew that if it was just bricks and mortar change, but that the store owner didn't necessarily know what to do with the new healthy food inventory in their store, that it wouldn't last. Well, like I said, that was the last year of existence of redevelopment. So the whole ship boop, goes crashing down and um, Food Policy Council founder at the time, Paula Daniels, said, you know what, this is a really great initiative and it's really important actually in terms of expanding access to healthy food. The small neighborhood markets are a critical access piece. So why don't we adopt the community market conversion program, Claire, and you come and work for the Food Policy Council and run it. And I was like, yes, all right, this is gonna save the program. Woo, I'm so happy. And you know, 
quickly learned that the LA Food Policy Council, a very small nonprofit, is not the community redevelopment agency, right? We don't have 75K to dole out. So it's a whole different context, a whole different landscape. So we had to pivot very, very quickly. I mean, first we started like, save these stores and save the program. And then we said, you know, we have to rethink this entire thing. What does the Food Policy Council have? Networks. Networks of professionals who want to give back, who have skills and talents that they want to share, it, that are in the food industry, that know food product and how to sell it. So we shifted the entire program to basically become about business development and leadership development, leveraging the, the network of experts that we had at our disposal and kind of harnessing their interest towards the needs and capacities of the small store owners. Um, did we have 75K to offer them? No, but instead we did a crowdsourced loan through Kiva Zip for $5,000 to buy a new refrigerator. So we got really creative. It was not the same level of um, physical transformation of the store, so we also had to rebrand and remessage and manage expectations. And um, the store that Rudy and I, the store owner that Rudy and I worked with very deeply, Nelson Garcia, who I mentioned before, he actually ended up um, paying for his own store transformation. He had some savings and he ultimately wanted to, to put it in that direction. Um, not every store owner is going to do that, and that's okay. But just uh, reconfiguring the business model itself makes a difference. So that's, I mean, that was a huge shift in our thinking about what we should do with the program. Typically, you mentioned that it's important for one to know their why. So I'm going to ask if each of you could quickly, just in one sentence, um, share your why. And then um, also, if anyone would like to comment on how important is it to you that others who volunteer for your organization share that why? Well, I believe that to whom much is given, much is required. And I believe that God has blessed me in tremendous ways. And it is only my duty to to give back. It's funny because I was talking to someone the other day and I was like, hashtag employed by God. <laughs> and they laughed, but um, that's really what it is. Hashtag employed by God. And I just believe that when you discover your purpose, then you're more purpose driven, then you're more directed then you are really more apt to add value to life. I believe that none of us are free until all of us are free. And because we're inherently connected, which I have talked quite a bit about today. Um, and to your second question about the importance of people who are involved in the organization declaring their why, I think that's really, really important. And I mentioned the network gatherings that we have, which is these sort of large public convenings. And one of the things that we're trying to do is really interrupt the traditional panel format. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, by having a little, by creating more experiential uh, learning. And a big piece of that is giving people the opportunity at every single convening to say, why they're there and what motivates them. And by declaring it to somebody else and being witnessed by somebody else, they're tonifying it within their own being as true for them. Like, yeah, that is, well, that is why I'm here and I, and I belong and I matter. And so that's a way, a, a small, tiny strategy for continuing to build our movement. My why is really a long narrative story of my life and uh, the experience that I've had, but in short, uh, my mom uh, came to this country when she was 18. She crossed the border, like a lot of people, uh, illegally. Uh, and uh, I'm the first in my family to go to college. She raised her, uh, me and my little brother by herself. Uh, she, um, because my father was an alcoholic and a, an abusive man. And so I grew up in an environment that was uh, very low income and also very sort of violent. And I think um, as I started getting older, I started to realize that that's not how it should be. And, and I started to pay attention to the fact that my family didn't have what other families had. And so there was this sort of theme of inequality that I started to see when I went to college, I was like, wait a minute, now I'm starting to have terms to these things that I saw. And wait a minute, it doesn't have to be that way. Wait, and, and also, I'm not the only one. That now actually I see that there's a ton of people that experience life like I did, and that's not right. So anytime that I see 
that's the reason someone asked me recently, why do you care about street vending? And I was like, the reason why I care about street vending is because when I see these women busting their ass on the street, I see my mom and I see how she did what she did for our family. And so that's why I put my heart into it. And when I see a youngster that's trying to figure out what to do with their life, I'm like, I see myself. Uh, when I see the soda that I was battling with, I'm like, I see the overweight Rudy when he was a kid that was picked on that didn't know why he was eating the stuff that he was eating, you know? So it's super personal for me, all the things that, that happen, and that's, that's, uh, that's a little piece of the why for me. I think mine's gonna sound so uh, elementary, but because nobody should go without food. Everybody should have food. I mean, there's tons of food at our grocery stores. Why would anybody ever go hungry, ever? I grew up not wasting food, so, and food is how so many people connect with each other. It's a basic need. And uh, sometimes I even, when I'm writing grants, it, it comes to me that why would you fund a music program when there's a kid who's hungry, who can't even function, uh, you know, to use a violin? Why would that be highly important over food? That's, that's all for me. Thank you, panel, very much. So, we're gonna, yes, go ahead and give them a hand.